The past two years have been incredibly challenging. After my mom died, I moved back home to become the primary caretaker for my father, Thon, who is in the final stages of colon cancer. The responsibility has been incredibly taxing, both emotionally and physically, on me and my wife, Mira. Watching someone you love slowly fade away is a heart-wrenching experience that words can hardly describe. Every day brings a new challenge, a fresh reminder of the inevitable. Yet in this twilight of his life, I've found a strange comfort in our one-on-one -on -one conversations, these rare moments of tranquility amidst the storm. Dad grew up in a small village in central Vietnam, and his stories often whisk me away to those simpler times. He speaks of his childhood with a sparkle in his eyes, narrating tales of mischievous adventures and youthful dreams. I hear about his journey to America, a leap into the unknown, fueled by hope and resilience. These stories, lighthearted and warm, have been my solace, a gentle reminder of the man he once was. As I prepared his chemo, meticulously adjusting the doses and equipment, careful not to disturb his trick shoulder, Dad's gaze fixed on me with a seriousness that halted my movements. Spencer, he said in a voice barely above a whisper, I have to tell you something. His eyes, usually filled with warmth, held a flicker of something unrecognizable. Was it fear, or perhaps regret? As I adjusted the pillows behind him, making him as comfortable as I could, I took his weathered hand in mine. The room was quiet, save for the gentle hum of the machines keeping him company. My heart pounded with a mix of apprehension and eagerness. Bah, whatever it is, I'm here, I said softly, encouraging him to share his hidden tale. There's something I've never told anyone, not even your mother, he began, his voice steady but distant. It's about what I witnessed during the war. I sat there, stunned. My father had always been a closed book when it came to his time as a South Vietnamese soldier during the Vietnam War. Whenever my siblings and I had dared to broach the subject, he would shut us down immediately, sometimes with a stern look, other times with a sharp word. Are you sure, Ba? I asked hesitantly. He nodded slowly, his gaze fixed on a point beyond the walls of the room. Yes, it's time you knew. He took a deep breath, as if gathering the strength to delve into memories long buried. The following story is a direct translation from Vietnamese to English of my dad's account of his experience with his permission. As I carefully position the Claymore mine, the jungle around me feels both suffocating and oddly comforting. I've become a shadow in these dense woods, with skills honed from too many battles fought and too many lives lost. The infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail, a serpent that weaves through the terrain, carrying the lifeblood of our enemy. Our position is strategically chosen. We're entrenched on a hilltop, offering a commanding view of the trail below. It's a defensible spot, with natural barriers on three sides. Our mission is simple. Eliminate any commie bastards daring to tread this path. The rest of my platoon of rangers, dispersed in strategic cover, are setting traps of their own. The air is thick with anticipation and the heavy scent of wet earth. The jungle, dense and unforgiving, seems to absorb our every breath, every heartbeat. We're not just soldiers. We're brothers in arms, each carrying a burden of loss and vengeance that weighs heavily on our souls. The Viet Cong, faceless enemies in the shadows, had taken more than territory. They had stolen pieces of our lives, leaving gaping wounds that would never heal. In the hushed whispers around the campfire, we don't just share rations, we share stories of our loved ones. Lieutenant Tuan talks about his little brother, a bright-eyed boy who wanted to be a teacher, now lying in an unmarked grave. Private Sai's voice breaks as he recounts the night the North Vietnamese soldiers stormed his village, his mother's cry haunting his dreams. As I finish setting the mine, my fingers, calloused and scarred, instinctively reach into the pocket of my uniform. I pull out a photo, worn from too many days tucked close to my heart. It's a family photo, one of the few keepsakes I have from a life that now seems a world away. My eyes linger on one face in particular, Heap, my older brother. Heap, the person who taught me how to ride a bike on the uneven dirt roads of Tui Lone. Heap, the person who used his own body to shield mine when our drunken father came home in a fury, his fists itching for something to hit. Aip, the village official with dreams of peace, whom the Viet Cong executed during the Tet Offensive, leaving his body in a ditch, 
along with their other victims, as if his life meant nothing. I can still see my sister-in-law, once vibrant and full of laughter, wearing the veil of a widow, her children's eyes reflecting a future stolen. Every patrol, every ambush we set, is not just a military strategy. It's a personal vendetta. In the quiet moments, when the jungle whispers its ancient secrets, I find myself talking to my brother, promising him justice, promising that his death will not be in vain. As I glance to my side, I see my friend, Specialist Vin, his fingers deftly moving over the beads of his rosary. Hey, Vin, I whisper, nudging him gently. Make sure you say a prayer for me, too. I give him a half-hearted smile. I'm a Buddhist, but in times like these, I'll take all the protection I can get. Vin looks up with a small, knowing smile. Don't worry, brother. God watches over all of us. Sergeant Anghia, a stern figure whose presence commands respect, moves silently among us his steps barely disturbing the forest floor. The lines on his face tell stories of countless battles, each crease a testament to his resilience. He pauses beside me, his eyes scanning the perimeter with a practiced gaze. Corporal Than, he addresses me, using my given name which few dared to utter. Everything secure on your end? I nod, meeting his intense gaze. Yes, Sergeant. The claymores are set and the men are in position. He places a firm hand on my shoulder, a rare gesture of camaraderie. Good. Remember, it's not just about holding the line, it's about protecting each other. We're all we have out here. His words, though simple, resonate deeply. I nod in agreement. As he moves on, I find a secluded spot near a towering tree, its roots offering a makeshift seat. The night is slowly descending, wrapping the jungle in a cloak of darkness. The chirps and calls of nocturnal creatures become the soundtrack of our vigil. Time seems to stretch and compress in these waiting hours. Every shadow becomes a potential threat, every rustle a possible enemy. In the enveloping silence, as the jungle's heart beats in sync with ours, I catch myself whistling softly. It's a nervous tick, a habit I've picked up somewhere along the way, a means to steady my jittering nerves. Late into the night, as the moon casts its silver glow over the jungle canopy, we lie in wait each man a coiled spring, ready to unleash hell at a moment's notice. In the dense underbrush, I hear the faintest sound of footsteps, muffled but unmistakable. The enemy is near, their hushed whispers barely audible over the heartbeat thumping in my ears. My grip tightens around the detonator wired to the claymores. The Viet Cong, unaware of their impending doom, continue their advance, inching closer to our trap. The tension is palpable, a physical weight in the air. I wait, my senses heightened, for the perfect moment to strike. And then, when they are almost upon us, close enough for me to smell what they had for dinner on their breaths, I press the detonator. The explosion is deafening, a fiery eruption that tears through the night. The claymore unleashes its deadly force, obliterating a group of Viet Cong unfortunate enough to be directly in its path. Shrapnel flies through the air, marking the beginning of our ambush. A spray of blood and viscera from the explosion showers down upon us, a sensory overload that's both nauseating and invigorating. I shoulder my M16, its familiar weight, a cold comfort in my hands, and fire into the shadows. Every burst of gunfire is a desperate attempt to fend off the encroaching horror, to protect the men beside me. The muzzle flash of our weapons cuts through the darkness, revealing glimpses of the enemy, shadows darting between trees, faces contorted in fear and rage. The Viet Cong, caught off guard by the ferocity of our assault, scramble to find cover. Their return fire is sporadic, disorganized, the panic evident in their ranks. We press our advantage, relentless and unforgiving. I keep firing, the recoil of my rifle jarring against my shoulder. Amidst the cacophony, the shouts of my comrades blend with the cries of the wounded and dying. Sergeant Anghia's voice cuts through the din, a steady command urging us to hold our ground, to keep the pressure, and we do, with a ferocity that borders on the primal. The enemy, realizing the futility of their position, begins to retreat. Their retreat is not orderly, it's a desperate scramble for survival, indicative of the chaos we've inflicted upon them. We do not let up, pursuing them with our gunfire, forcing them deeper into the dark embrace of the jungle. It quickly turns into a rout or so we think.
As the last of the gunfire dies down, a heavy silence descends upon the forest. The aftermath is a grim sight, the ground littered with bodies of both friends and foes, but mostly foes. The smell of death permeates the air. In the eerie calm that follows our ambush, we quickly begin tending to the wounded, our hands slick with blood and soil. My heart races, adrenaline and fear mingling in my veins. I can sense it in the air, the sharp electric tang of impending doom. It's an almost palpable shift in the atmosphere, like a noose tightening around our collective necks. Lieutenant Tuan, sensing it too, barks out an order to our radio operator, Private First Class Huang. His voice, laced with urgency, cuts through the bedlam. Call in air support now. Huang's voice is calm but urgent, his fingers gripping the radio handset like a lifeline. Tango 3 to Falcon Base. Heavy enemy engagement. Requesting immediate close air support at Grid Bravo Char. As Huang relays the coordinates, his voice suddenly cuts off. A sniper's bullet pierces through his helmet with a sickening thud. He slumps forward, his lifeless body still clutching the radio. Tuan snatches the radio handset, his voice a mix of determination and desperation. Falcon Base, this is Tango 3. Coordinates Bravo Charlie 5 Niner. We need immediate air support. Over. The words barely leave his mouth when another bullet strikes Tuan squarely in the chest, a clean shot that sends him reeling backward. The handset falls from his grip as he collapses. There's a crackling response from the radio, the voice on the other end distant but clear. Tango 3, Falcon Base copies. Air support is en route. Hang tight. Over. Suddenly, without warning, more bullets whistle through the trees, an invisible death raining from all sides. In the midst of the chaos, Sergeant Ingia swiftly assumes command. Corporal Thon, fire a flare, he shouts. Without hesitation, I reach for the flare gun. I aim skyward, and with a deep breath, pull the trigger. The flare bursts into the night sky, a beacon of bright red against the dark canopy, casting an eerie glow over the battlefield. The sudden illumination reveals a sight that causes my heart to sink. Before us, stretching across the forest floor, is what appears to be an entire battalion of Viet Cong soldiers. Their numbers are overwhelming, like a dark tide threatening to engulf us. A shrill whistle pierces through air, a harbinger of further violence. It's quickly followed by a flood of Viet Cong charging out of the jungle, their weapons firing wildly. Their faces are a blur of hatred, illuminated sporadically by the flashes of their guns. In an instant, our position transforms into a maelstrom of bullets and screams. We return fire, but it's a desperate, uneven battle. Hold your ground, Ngia barks. The gunfire intensifies as the Viet Cong try to overrun our position before air support arrives. We fight back with everything we have, but the fear is palpable. Every soldier knows that the next bullet could be theirs. The enemy crashes into our lines with a ferocity that turns the battle into a savage melee. Bayonets flash in the dim light slicing through the air with deadly precision. Rifle butts smash against bone and flesh. Fists hardened by desperation strike with a raw, primal force. In the midst of this chaos, a Viet Cong soldier lunges at me, his bayonet gleaming in the moonlight, attached menacingly to the barrel of his AK-47. The feeling of imminent death grips me but instinct takes over. In a swift motion, I sidestep his charge, feeling the rush of air as the bayonet slices past me. I grab his arm, using his own momentum against him, and twist it violently. The AK clatters to the ground. We are now locked in a desperate struggle, our faces just centimeters apart. The soldier, quick and agile, doesn't falter. With a sudden jerk, he breaks free of my grasp and in a fluid motion sweeps my rifle away, leaving me disarmed too. His eyes lock onto mine. I can see the raw desire to survive in his eyes. We both know it's either him or me. With a surge of strength, I push him back. He stumbles, but quickly regains his balance, his eyes never leaving mine. We circle each other warily, each waiting for an opening. The sounds of battle around us fade into the background, this moment becoming a world unto itself. Suddenly he lunges again, his fists aimed at my face. I deflect his blows, feeling the impact resonate up my arms. I counter with a punch of my own, catching him off guard. He reels back, but I don't let up. I grab a discarded rifle from the ground and swing with all my might. The rifle butt connects with his head with a sickening thud, sending him sprawling to the ground. He's dazed, but not defeated.
Without hesitation, I raise my rifle, aiming it squarely at his chest. The weight of the decision presses on me, but survival leaves no room for doubt. I squeeze the trigger. The sound of the shot echoes in my ears. His body jerks with the impact, then lies still. I don't linger on the act. There's no time for remorse or reflection in the heat of battle. In the midst of this frenzy, I catch sight of Sergeant Ingia. He's moving with a limp, his usual steady gait now faltering. Blood seeps through the dark green fabric of his fatigues. Despite his injury, he continues to fire, his resolve unbroken. I rush to his side. Sergeant, you're hit, I shout over the din of battle. Medic, I need a medic here. Ingia grabs my arm. His grip is strong, belying the pain he must be enduring. Listen, Thon, he says with urgency. We need to retreat, regroup, and live to fight another day. But, Sergeant, I protest. He interrupts me with a fierce intensity. Do it, Corporal. That's an order. Save the men. Reluctantly, I signal to the remaining soldiers, shouting orders for a fighting retreat. We start to fall back, moving with urgency but maintaining cover. The enemy, sensing our retreat, presses their attack, emboldened. Sergeant Ingia, despite his injury, maneuvers towards the M60 machine gun, a hulking presence. With deliberate, almost methodical movements, he mounts the gun, steadying it against his shoulder. He lays down a withering barrage of cover fire, the machine gun roaring to life in his hands. Each burst from the M60 is like a thunderclap, reverberating through the jungle. As we fall back, retreating into the dense undergrowth, I can't help but glance over my shoulder. I see Sergeant Nihia lying next to his spent weapon. I see him with a grenade clutched tightly in his hand in a final act of bravery and self-sacrifice. His eyes meet mine one last time, conveying a silent message of farewell and a command to keep going. Nihia, no, I scream, but it's too late. He pulls the pin and hurls himself towards a group of advancing enemy soldiers. The explosion that follows is deafening, a fiery blast that lights up the night. As we retreat, the air suddenly trembles with the ominous whistle of incoming mortars. The forest erupts into a symphony of explosions, each blast shaking the earth beneath my feet. Dirt and debris rain down as trees splinter and fall, their mighty forms reduced to mere obstacles in our path. In the mayhem, a mortar shell lands perilously close. The impact of the shell sends me flying, my body slamming into the earth with brutal force. For a moment I'm dazed, my ears ringing, vision blurred. My cumbersome flak jacket takes the brunt of the blast. I feel a sharp pain in my chest, a searing heat that spreads rapidly. Instinctively, I reach for the source of the pain and find a jagged piece of shrapnel embedded in the jacket. It's mere millimeters from my heart. Crawling on all fours, I desperately search for any sign of my platoon. But the smoky haze renders everything indistinct, shapes and shadows merging into an unrecognizable blur. The realization hits hard. I am separated from my unit alone in this hellscape. I crawl into a shallow ditch, my body scraping against the rough terrain. The ditch, barely deep enough to provide cover, becomes my temporary refuge. My heart pounds frantically in my chest. The air is thick with smoke and the smell of burning foliage. Through the haze I catch glimpses of enemy soldiers sweeping the area, their voices a menacing murmur in the dense jungle. I press myself lower, my face against the damp earth, trying to make myself as small as possible. The mud and leaves cling to my uniform, blending me into the landscape. The fear of capture, of falling into enemy hands, is overwhelming. Memories of stories told by fellow soldiers about the brutality of the VC surge through my mind. I hold my breath as a group of soldiers passes by the ditch. Their boots come perilously close, mud and leaves falling from their soles. I can hear their heavy breathing, the rustle of their uniforms, the clinking of their weapons. One of them pauses, and for a moment I fear he has spotted me. But then, a distant sound catches his attention. The faint but unmistakable roar of jet engines crescendos through the jungle, pulling my pursuer's gaze skyward. The soldiers around my hiding spot suddenly become agitated, their focus shifting from the ground search to the skies above. The sound grows louder, more distinct, a herald of impending doom. I risk a glance upwards and see a squadron of A-4 Skyhawks streaking across the sky, their sleek forms cutting through the clouds. They move with a precision that speaks of deadly intent, a force of nature unto themselves. Only the Americans fly A-4S. The VC soldiers, now fully aware of the impending danger, 
scatter in a frenzied attempt to evade the aerial assault. The jungle canopy shudders under the thunderous roar of the skyhawks. Suspended for a fleeting moment, the world seems to hold its breath. Then, with a precision born of countless sorties, the aircraft release their payload. The objects, canister-like in shape, descend with a grim inevitability, their trajectory marking a path towards the heart of the enemy's position. As the canisters impact, an inferno erupts, not the familiar searing orange of napalm, but an otherworldly glow that paints the pre-dawn in hues of eerie green and purple. The flames, unnaturally vibrant, consume the foliage with a voracious appetite, leaving behind a surreal landscape bathed in ghostly light. I know I must move, must put distance between myself and this alien inferno, or risk being consumed by it. The heat is intense, a wave of searing air that presses against my skin, urging me to flee. Crawling out of the ditch, I stagger to my feet, disoriented and dazed. My lungs ache from the acrid smoke, my eyes water from the intense light of the flames. I stumble forward. The ground underfoot is uneven, treacherous with fallen branches and debris. I'm driven by a primal instinct to survive, to escape this hellish scene. The fire seems to chase me, its fingers of flame licking at my heels. As the first light of dawn begins to filter through the smoke-filled sky, I keep moving, my legs pushing forward on sheer instinct. Emerging into a clearing, I pause for a moment to catch my breath. I scan the surroundings, searching for any sign of my comrades, any indication of where to head next. The eerie silence is unsettling. My throat is parched from the smoke and exertion. Reaching for my canteen, I unscrew the cap with trembling hands. Just as I raise it to my lips, a sudden sharp crack splits the air. Instinctively, I duck, but not before feeling the shock of impact against the canteen. Water splashes across my face as the canteen is violently jerked from my grasp. A sniper's bullet, aimed with deadly precision, barely missed my throat. The sharp report of the sniper's rifle echoed through the clearing. Pinned down, I crouch low, my heart racing, adrenaline surging through my veins. Every instinct screams to move, but I know the slightest motion could spell my end. The underbrush is dense, a tapestry of shadows that could conceal an army. My breathing is shallow, each exhale a calculated risk. The sniper is patient, a tiger waiting for his prey to make a fatal mistake. Minutes stretch into an eternity. The sniper's silence is as terrifying as his bullets. Staying here is a death sentence. I need to locate him, turn the tables. I remember my training in counter-sniping. Find the sniper's likely position, use the environment to your advantage, and move unpredictably. The shot came from the north judging by the sun's position and the bullet's trajectory. He must be nestled high with a clear view of the clearing. I focus on the trees, looking for any irregularities, any hint of human presence. Then I see it, a slight glint, a reflection of sunlight off a scope. It's subtle, but to a trained eye, it's as glaring as a beacon. My pulse quickens. I've located the son of a bitch. With the sniper's position pinpointed, I start to formulate a plan to outmaneuver him. I need to close the distance without being detected. I grab a sizable rock from the ground, its rough surface biting into my palm. With a swift, practiced motion, I hurl it towards the east side of the clearing, opposite my position. The sniper, predictably, shifts his fire towards the sound. It's a momentary distraction, but it's all I need. I seize the opportunity, bolting towards the dense thicket on my left. Each step is deliberate, calculated to avoid snapping twigs or rustling leaves. The sun is now high, casting deep shadows that I use to mask my movements. I keep my eyes fixed on the spot where I saw the glint, using it as a guide. As I inch closer, the details of the sniper's perch become clearer. He's nestled in a crook of a large tree, his position commanding a clear view of the clearing. I continue my approach, moving in a wide arc to flank his position. The ground here is littered with fresh fallen leaves, a natural carpet that muffles my footsteps. I'm close now, close enough to hear the faint creak of him reloading his rifle, scanning the clearing for any sign of movement. The sniper is a slight figure, his body language tense and focused. He's armed with an SKS rifle. A conical straw hat conceals his face, blending him into the natural surroundings. My hand tightens around the grip of my M16. I raise it slowly, 
lining up the sights with where I expect his head to be. My breathing steadies, my finger gently pulling on the trigger. My rifle jams. The unmistakable click of the failed mechanism echoes mockingly in the quiet jungle. Panic surges within me, a cold wave threatening to wash away my resolve. The VC sniper, alerted to my presence, whirls around to face me. To my shock, it's not the hardened warrior I expected, but a young woman. Her black hair matted with sweat is tied back in simple pigtails that give her a deceptively innocent appearance. Her face streaked with dirt and an expression of deadly determination. For a moment we lock eyes, each of us taken aback by the other's appearance. Her dark brown eyes, wide with surprise, quickly harden into a steely resolve. Taking advantage of my hesitation, she discards her empty rifle and lunges at me with a machete, the blade glinting menacingly in the sunlight. Die, imperialist dog, she spits. I react instinctively, sidestepping her initial strike, but the momentum of her attack brings us crashing together. Our struggle is fierce, a tangle of limbs and weapons. The machete slices through the air, narrowly missing my face. Our bodies collide with a force that knocks the breath from my lungs. I grasp at her wrists, trying to wrestle the machete away. But her grip is unyielding. The edge of the blade presses against my neck, a cold, sharp threat that sends a shiver down my spine. I muster all my strength and manage to twist her arm, forcing the machete away from my neck. With a sudden surge of energy, I push her off balance. She stumbles backward and I seize the opportunity, tackling her to the ground. I try to pin her down, covering her mouth with my hand in a desperate attempt to prevent her from making any noise that might alert her comrades. But she's relentless, her survival instincts as sharp as her blade. She sinks her teeth into my fingers, the pain searing and immediate. I wince, feeling the warmth of my own blood trickle down my skin. Her teeth sink deeper, and the sharp pain forces me to release her. She scrambles to her feet. The machete is still clutched tightly in her hand, its blade smeared with my blood. My arm throbs with pain, blood soaking through the sleeve of my fatigues. The sounds of approaching footsteps break through the chaos of our struggle. I can't tell if it's friend or foe. As the VC sniper raises her machete for another deadly strike, her eyes suddenly widen in abject horror, fixated on something directly behind me. The bloodlust in her eyes gives way to unmistakable terror, halting her mid-swing. She stands frozen, her body tensed as if ready to flee. Oh my God, she manages to utter, her face pale. Comrade Fong? I dare not turn to look, fearing any movement might reignite her attack. But the expression on her face tells me all I need to know. Something behind me poses a greater threat than our desperate struggle. I slowly pivot, keeping one wary eye on the sniper as I turn to face the new threat. Standing mere meters away is a figure so grotesque, so otherworldly, that my mind struggles to comprehend it. It's humanoid, but its skin is blistered and peeling, like the flesh of someone who has been consumed by fire and somehow survived. The remnants of a North Vietnamese uniform cling to its twisted form, the fabric melding into the charred skin. Another figure emerges from the jungle, equally monstrous. Its face is a nightmarish mask, swollen and deformed with eyes that no longer resemble anything human. I notice the gold crucifix hanging from its neck. It belonged to my friend, Vin, now reduced to this unholy mockery of a man. One by one, more of these gruesome beings step into the clearing. Their movements are jerky, unnatural, as if their bodies are rebelling against the very act of motion. The air fills with a stench so foul it clings to the back of my throat, a mix of decay and burnt flesh. The beings close in, their movements unnerving in their disjointed nature. Their mouths snap open and closed with a deformed eagerness. Foam gathers at the corners of their lips, dripping down in sickening trails. The sound of their teeth snapping together is a macabre rhythm, echoing ominously in the clearing. As the figures surround us, the sniper and I are inexorably pushed back to back, our previous struggle forgotten in the face of this unimaginable horror. The figure that was once Vin inches closer, his grotesque face a mask of unrecognizable torment. Despite his disfigurement, I think I can still see traces of the man he used to be. In a desperate attempt I speak, hoping some part of my friend still lingers within this monstrous shell. Vin, it's me, Thon, I shout, desperation lacing my voice. Remember, brother, we fought together in Hue. But the words fall on deaf ears, or perhaps ears that can no longer comprehend. 
Vin tilts his head, a mimicry of curiosity, but his gaze remains hollow, soulless. He lunges at me. I barely dodge his grasp, feeling the heat of his breath, a fetid gust that smells of death and decay. Vin barrels into the sniper, who is visibly caught off guard. The collision sends her tumbling to the ground, her machete clattering away into the underbrush. Vin's blistered body presses down on her with a ravenous intent. I scramble for my M16, my fingers working frantically to clear the jam. My heart pounds against my chest, each second stretching into an eternity. Finally, with a satisfying click, the mechanism frees, and the rifle is ready. I raise the rifle, aiming at the nightmarish figures converging around us. The first shot rings out, the sound sharp and clear in the dense jungle. The bullet strikes one of the things in the chest, but to my horror it barely falters. Its body jerks with the impact, yet it continues its advance. I fire again and again, but it's like shooting into a nightmare that refuses to end. The bullets tear through its charred flesh, creating gaping wounds that ooze a thick, dark substance. Yet it keeps moving, driven by an unfathomable will. I switch the fire selector to full auto. My rifle bucks in my hands as I unleash a torrent of bullets. The creature staggers under the barrage. Rounds rip through its mangled body, each hit a burst of dark, viscous fluid. Finally, the creature collapses to the ground, its form writhing in an unnatural, spasmodic dance. The others, undeterred by the fate of their kin, continue their relentless advance. The magazine clicks empty. Reloading swiftly, I unleash another hail of bullets, creating a temporary corridor through the encroaching swarm. The horde, though seemingly impervious to pain, are momentarily staggered by the force of the gunfire, providing me with a fleeting chance to break free. As I make my escape, the desperate cries of the sniper, still entangled in a horrific struggle with the creature that was once Vin, reach my ears. The instinct to survive screams within me to leave her to her fate. She is, after all, the enemy. But as I glance back, seeing the terror in her eyes, a different instinct takes over. No one, not even the Viet Cong, deserves such a gruesome end. Gritting my teeth, I double back, picking up the machete she dropped in her struggle. The weapon feels crude, but effective weapon. With a determined swing, I bring the machete down on Vin, severing the sinewy charred arm that pins the sniper to the ground. He recoils, his inhuman wails piercing the air. Turning Vin over to face me, I see what's left of him. I feel a pang of sorrow. Vin, please, I plead hoping against hope for a sign that some part of my friend still exists within this tormented shell. But the creature before me is a far cry from the man I once knew. Go with God, brother, I whisper with tears in my eyes. With a heavy heart I bring the machete down with all my might. The blade cleaves through Vin's neck, an act of mercy to end his tortured existence. As I turn back to the sniper, I instantly regret ever showing her any kindness. She's regained her footing, her SKS rifle now trained directly at my head. Her expression is a mix of fear, defiance, and something that looks like regret. Even after saving her life, she still sees me as the enemy. I brace myself for the inevitable. But then, in a split second, she shifts her aim slightly, and before I can process what's happening, she pulls the trigger. The bullet whizzes past my ear, striking something behind me. I spin around following the trajectory of her shot, and there on the ground lies the one she'd called Comrade Fong. He's squirming on the floor, a bullet hole perfectly centered between his eyes. The sniper lowers her weapon, taking a watchful step towards me, her eyes not leaving mine. I motion towards the dense undergrowth. We need to get out of here now, I say, my voice a mix of command and plea. She hesitates, the weight of years of indoctrination and hatred evident in her eyes. I extend the machete towards her, handle first. It's a gesture of trust, or perhaps necessity. After a tense moment, her fingers wrap around the handle. Let's go, she declares. As we prepare to leave the clearing, I can't help but pause at Vin's body. His head, nearly severed, still snaps in a reflexive motion. Steadying my trembling hands, I reach out to the crucifix dangling from his neck. I gently yank the chain, breaking it free. I can at least return it to his parents. They deserve something to remember him by. As the other unnatural beings shamble closer, the sniper's urgent voice cuts through my panic. This way, she says, pointing towards a seemingly unremarkable spot amidst the dense greenery. With no time to think, I follow her, 
the moans of the undead fallen echoing in our wake. We push through the underbrush, the jungle closing in around us like a living entity. We arrive at a small clearing, obscured by a tangle of vines and foliage. The sniper quickly kneels, brushing aside leaves and dirt to reveal a hidden entrance, the mouth of a tunnel. My heart skips a beat. The Viet Cong use complex tunnel networks to launch surprise attacks and disappear without a trace. Memories of being a tunnel rat on search and destroy missions flash through my mind. Those missions were a dangerous game of cat and mouse, navigating the claustrophobic confines of the tunnels, never knowing what lay around the next bend. They were often riddled with traps, punji sticks smeared with feces, tripwires connected to grenades and deadfalls. Suspicion and dread gnaw at my mind as I eye the dark opening warily. The sniper's eyes meet mine. She can see my hesitation. It's deserted, she assures me. We abandoned this section after a partial collapse. It's not safe, but it's better than what's out there. Her words carry a tone of sincerity, a raw urgency. I weigh my options, the known horror of the Viet Cong against the unspeakable terror of the creatures behind us. The decision is grim, but clear. We enter the tunnel, the sniper quickly sealing the entrance behind us, obscuring any trace of our passage. The immediate danger outside fades, replaced by the oppressive darkness of the tunnel. The air is thick, heavy with the scent of damp earth. I flick on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the pitch black, revealing a narrow, earthen corridor. My M16 feels cumbersome in the cramped space. Every sense is heightened, my eyes straining to catch any movement, my ears tuned to the slightest sound. The sniper moves ahead of me, her movements confident yet cautious. She knows these passages like the back of her hand. The silence is suffocating, broken only by our soft footsteps and the distant, muffled sounds of the ongoing chaos above. The walls of the tunnel seem to close in around us, the earthy smell becoming more pronounced with each step. Watch your step, she whispers, pointing to a barely visible tripwire stretched across the path. Her warning comes just in time, my foot hovering centimeters from the lethal trap. I nod my thanks, carefully stepping over the wire. We pass small alcoves, some containing remnants of supplies, others empty, save for the ghosts of their past occupants. My flashlight's beam dances across the tunnel walls, throwing eerie shadows that play tricks on my mind. Every shadow becomes a potential enemy, every sound a threat. My finger rests uneasily on the trigger guard of my rifle, ready for any danger. We eventually come to a spot that appears to have been a makeshift kitchen. The space is slightly wider than the rest of the tunnel, with charred remnants of a fire pit and scattered utensils. The sniper stops, her gaze scanning the area. She motions towards a corner where a few rusted cans and a small battered kettle lay. We can rest here for a bit, she says, her voice barely above a whisper. Exhausted, I lower myself to the ground, my back against the cool earth of the tunnel wall. The sniper does the same, keeping a cautious distance between us, her eyes never leaving me. What were those bombs? She demands, her voice tinged with accusation. Those weren't normal explosives. They turned those men into... Monsters. I shake my head. I don't know, I reply honestly. I've never seen anything like that before. Her expression hardens, the lines of distrust deepening. They were dropped by your American masters, she accuses. You have to know something. Frustration and anger well up inside me. They're only bombing your people because you keep raiding and attacking my people, I retort. The sniper's expression darkens, her eyes flashing with a mix of anger and hurt. How dare you, she spits out, her voice low but filled with venom. Do you know what the Americans did to... She doesn't finish her statement. The words hang in the air, unspoken, as if they're too painful to bring to life. Instead, she just sits there silently, her hands resting on her rifle, her gaze fixed on me. As we settle into an awkward silence, our eyes meet occasionally, quickly looking away each time, as if acknowledging each other's existence is a betrayal of our respective causes. The silence between us is suffocating, a tangible presence in the cramped tunnel. I whistle a tune under my breath, trying to distract myself from the oppressive atmosphere of the tunnel and the haunting moans that seem to claw at the very air around us. For a long time the sniper remains silent, 
her expression unreadable as she listens to the faint whistle. Hey, asshole, she snaps, her tone laced with irritation. Can you stop that? I cease the tune mid-breath, a bit taken aback. Sorry, I mutter. After another extended silence, she speaks again. Why did you save me? She whispers, her eyes not meeting mine. I ponder her question. I don't know, I admit. Maybe because, in that moment, you were just another person trying to survive. Like me. There's a long pause before she speaks again. You know, I would have killed you, given the chance. I know, I reply. And I would have done the same. After another tense silence, I muster the courage to ask her a question. What's your name? She looks at me, her eyes narrowing with suspicion. Why do you want to know? She asks, her tone guarded. Are you interrogating me? It's... It's just a name, I say, trying to sound as non-threatening as possible. I'm just curious. She eyes me cautiously, as if measuring the sincerity of my words. Finally, she relents, her voice softening just a fraction. My name is Tu Yet, she says. There's a hint of reluctance in her admission, a vulnerability she's likely not used to showing. Tu Yet, I repeat, letting her name roll off my tongue. It feels strange, yet oddly comforting to address her by name to acknowledge her humanity in this inhumane situation. I'm Thon, by the way, I add. Tuyet looks at me for a moment longer, her eyes scrutinizing. You look like a Thon, she finally says. What does that mean, I ask, trying to understand the implication behind her words. She shrugs, a guarded expression on her face. I don't know. You just do. Her speech pattern intrigues me. It's not the northern accent I had expected. Your accent? You're from Kwangnam province, aren't you? So what if I am? You are too, she replies, picking up on my similar accent. I'm tempted to ask her where her village is, to delve deeper into this unexpected connection between us. But I stop myself. I know too well the risks involved in sharing such information. Knowing where someone is from in times like these could put loved ones at risk for reprisals. Driven by necessity, we begin to form an uneasy alliance. Our conversation is sparse, limited to the essentials of survival. As we share rations, a mix of my MREs and her rice cakes, there's a begrudging acknowledgement of our shared humanity. We talk in hushed tones, exchanging information about the tunnel layout and the possible whereabouts of our respective units. Our dialogue is cautious, each of us careful not to reveal too much. As we reach for the same rice cake, our hands accidentally brush against each other. She recoils swiftly as if stung, and I see a faint blush color her cheeks in the dim light of my flashlight. For a fleeting second our eyes meet. Despite the grime and fatigue that marks her features, there's an undeniable beauty there. Her eyes, dark and deep, hold a resilience that's both haunting and captivating. Sorry, I mutter. It's okay, Tuyet replies, quickly regaining her composure. Our conversation is interrupted by a distant but distinct sound the thumping of helicopter rotors. The sound grows steadily louder, vibrating through the earth and resonating in the narrow tunnel. Tuyet and I exchange tense glances, a silent agreement passing between us. We need to see what's happening above. Cautiously, Tuyet leads me towards a small aperture that serves as a discreet observation point. As we peer through the gap, the sight that greets us is both surreal and disconcerting. A squadron of UH-1 Hueys hovers above the jungle, their silhouettes imposing against the smoky sky. There's something off about them. They bear no markings or insignias, their usual identifiers conspicuously absent. It's as if they've been deliberately stripped of any affiliation, rendering them ghosts in the sky. Through the small opening we witness the choppers rain hellfire down on the undead. Machine guns chatter, spitting streams of deadly lead. Rockets streak from their pods, trailing plumes of smoke before exploding amidst the reanimated corpses. The impacts are devastating, tearing through the undead with brutal efficiency. Limbs are severed, bodies eviscerated. The scene unfolds like a choreographed ballet of devastation. In the eerie calm that follows the assault, the acrid scent of burnt flesh and vegetation hangs heavy in the air. The sounds of destruction subside, replaced by a haunting stillness that blankets the area. Then movement from the trees catches my eye. A small group of figures emerges from the jungle's edge. They move with a weary but deliberate gait, their fatigues torn and stained with blood and mud. 
Recognition jolts through me. They're survivors from my platoon, battered but miraculously unaffected by the bombs that transformed others into nightmarish beings. Their arms wave frantically above their heads, desperately signally to the circling Hueys. The helicopters hover idly for a moment, as if contemplating their next move. For a fleeting moment, a glimmer of hope is sparked in my heart. Perhaps they've come to rescue the survivors to pluck them from this hellish wasteland. But in an instant, that hope is shattered. The helicopter's guns roar to life, spewing forth a torrent of bullets. The ground around the survivors erupts in a storm of dirt and debris. The Hueys transform from potential saviors to executioners. The men, my brothers in arms, react with a mixture of disbelief and horror. They scatter, desperately seeking cover where there is none. Their movements are frantic, but their fate is sealed. The relentless hail of bullets from above tracks their every move. I watch, powerless, as one by one they fall. The Hueys don't discriminate. They tear through flesh and bone like mechanized vultures. Their guns do not cease until the last man lies still, his pleas for mercy drowned out by the roar of gunfire. As the Hueys begin to ascend, leaving behind a scene of merciless carnage, Tuyet's gaze fixes on one helicopter veering off in a different direction. A look of sheer terror washes over her face. It's heading towards my village, she whispers, her voice laced with panic. My blood runs cold at the implications. After witnessing the ruthless execution of my platoon, the prospect of that helicopter reaching her village is horrifying. The rules of war seem to have been abandoned. Tuyet's hands clench into fists, her knuckles whitening under the strain. For a fleeting moment her hardened façade cracks, revealing a vulnerability that I hadn't seen before. My family, she breathes, her voice barely audible. I have to get to them. With a sense of urgency that words can't describe, she leads the way through the tunnel. I follow close behind, my mind racing with the implications of what's unfolding above us. As we move, Tuyet explains in hushed, anxious tones about a hidden tunnel entrance in her village, used as an emergency escape route during bombings. It's well concealed, she says. We've used it to evacuate civilians during air raids. Be careful, she warns. The section is unstable and there could be traps that haven't been disarmed. I nod, my senses heightened to the potential dangers lurking in the shadows. As we progress, the tunnel begins to narrow, the walls closing in until we're forced to move in a single file. Suddenly Tuyet freezes, her body tensing. I stop abruptly, sensing the shift in her demeanor. She signals for silence, her hand raised in a warning gesture. In the silence, a soft, sinister hissing becomes audible. It's rhythmic, almost hypnotic, and seems to resonate from the very walls of the tunnel. The hissing grows louder, a serenade that prickles the skin. Tuyet recoils, backing into me. I peer over her shoulder and my blood runs cold. Emerging from the murky shadows, a monstrous sight unfolds before us. A two-headed viper, hideously mutated, its scales glistening with a sickly sheen under the flashlight's beam. Each head, larger than a man's, sways menacingly, forked tongues flickering in the stale air, its eyes beady and unblinking. We press our backs against the damp tunnel walls, our breaths shallow, trying to make ourselves as small and inconspicuous as possible. The conjoined creature hasn't seen us yet. I can feel Tuya's hand gripping mine, her fingernails digging into my palm with fear. Every instinct screams at me to flee, but I know movement would be fatal. In this tense standoff, a drop of sweat trickles down my forehead, stinging my eye. I blink hard, trying to maintain focus. The sudden, involuntary twitch of my eyelid causes the drop to fall to the ground with an almost imperceptible sound. But to the viper, it's a clarion call. Both heads snap towards the sound, their eyes narrowing, their bodies coiling in anticipation. The viper pounces on us, its dual head striking with terrifying precision jaws unhinging to reveal rows of dripping fangs. Tuyet and I dive in opposite directions, narrowly avoiding the venomous fangs. The creature's body, thick and sinewy, coils and twists with an unnatural agility. The viper's assault is relentless, a deadly blur of scales and venom. I scramble to my feet, my rifle in hand. Firing in these tight quarters is a dangerous gamble, but it's our only chance. I aim at the creature but the confines of the tunnel make it nearly impossible to get a clear shot. The serpent moves with a chilling speed, its bodies twisting and undulating in the dim light. 
Every time I think I have a clear shot, it contorts, evading the barrel of my gun. As the creature lurches at us again, I notice something crucial. The two heads, although attached to the same body, are not in sync. They seem to struggle against each other, each head vying for control, unaware of the other's actions. It's a flaw that we can exploit. To yet, I whisper urgently, the heads, they're not moving in sync. We can use that. What do you want to do, she asks, her voice trembling. When I give the signal, make noise on your side, draw it towards you. She looks at me, her eyes wide with fear and disbelief. You're insane. Trust me, I say, formulating a risky plan in my mind. We can turn one against the other. Tuyet hesitates, uncertain, but one of the heads lunges again, narrowly missing her. The urgency of the situation leaves no room for doubt. She nods. Tuyet grasps her machete, striking it against the tunnel wall. The sharp metallic clangs echo through the confined space, drawing the attention of the mutant viper. Its heads, momentarily distracted, swivel towards the source of the noise. Seizing the opportunity, I leap towards the right head, wrapping my arms around its thick, muscular neck. The creature writhes violently, its scales abrasive against my skin. The right head, in its frantic attempts to dislodge me, thrashes wildly, slamming me against the left. The left head, its attention drawn towards me, strikes with lethal intent, its jaws agape and fangs dripping with venom. In the split second before the left head's fangs can sink into me, I release my grip on the right head and throw myself to the side. The left head's jaws snap shut with a sickening crunch, but not on me. Instead, its fangs sink deep into its twin, one of them piercing right through the eye. The sound is grotesque, a mix of a wet pop and a muffled scream. The right head writhes in agony, its eye oozing a viscous fluid that glistens in the dim light. The two heads, now entwined in a horrific embrace, seem to realize their mistake. But it's too late. The left head tries to disengage, pulling back with a desperate force, but the fang is lodged deeply, effectively pinning them together. The snake's body convulses, its movements becoming a chaotic dance of self-destruction. We stand there, frozen in terror. Then survival instinct kicks in. Move, I shout, grabbing Tuyet's hand. We scramble away from the undulating mass, our footsteps pounding against the tunnel floor. As Tuyet leads me down the twisting passage, the tunnel gradually slopes upward, signaling our approach to the surface. The air grows fresher, less stifling, a small mercy in this claustrophobic underworld. Finally, we reach an end. Tuyet pushes aside a wooden panel disguised as part of the floor, revealing the dim interior of a small structure. We emerge into a rice storage hut, the musty smell of grains mingling with the earthy scent of the tunnel. The hut is cramped, filled with sacks of rice and agricultural tools. We barely have a moment to catch our breath before the ground beneath us starts to tremble. A low, thunderous rumbling fills the air, growing louder and more intense with each passing second. The sound is unmistakable, the heavy rhythmic thumping of a Huey helicopter rotor hovering directly overhead. Its presence is oppressive, like a dark cloud casting a shadow over us. The hut's wooden structure vibrates with the force of the rotor wash, dust and small debris falling from the rafters. The sacks of rice shift slightly, the tools clinking against each other in a discordant symphony. Tuye moves to the small window, peering out with wary eyes. Her face drains of color at what she sees. Peeking cautiously beside Tuye, the harrowing scene unfolding outside the hut sears into my memory, a tableau of terror and brutality. The helicopter, a menacing behemoth, looms over the village like a predatory bird. Below, figures move with ruthless efficiency, soldiers but unlike any I've seen before. They're dressed like American commandos, but their uniforms are stripped of any unit insignia or flags, rendering them ghosts, devoid of identity or allegiance. The soldiers herd the villagers into the center of the hamlet with a cold, methodical precision. The villagers' faces etched with fear and confusion stumble and fall as they're pushed and prodded like cattle. The cries of children, the wails of mothers, the pleas of elders all merge as they huddle together in fear. The soldiers tower over them, shouting orders in broken Vietnamese, their words laced with curses and impatience. One woman, clutching a wailing infant to her chest, stumbles in her haste. A soldier hoists her over his shoulder. She kicks and screams, her cries muffled against the camouflaged fabric of his uniform, her infant clutched tightly in her arms. 
An elderly man, his back bent with age, falls to his knees, his breath ragged with exhaustion. A boot to his back sends him sprawling to the ground, his frail body crumpling under the assault. No mercy is shown, no compassion given. One particular figure strides confidently through the chaos. He stands taller than the other soldiers, an air of authority emanating from him. This man, clad in the same unmarked fatigues, wears mirror sunglasses that reflect the terror around him. A yellow bandana conceals his face. His men step aside, parting a path for him as he approaches the center of the commotion. They address him with a tone of respect tinged with fear. Major Wolf, one of the soldiers, reports. Wolf stops and surveys the scene with a calculated gaze, his hands clasped behind his back. He turns to the soldier who had spoken. Report, Sergeant, he commands, his voice firm and devoid of emotion. Sir, the villagers claim they don't know anything about Project Grim Harvest. We've searched the houses, interrogated several of them. Nothing. Wolf responds with an icy, humorless chuckle. Bullshit they don't, he says, his voice tinged with scorn. He pulls down his bandana, revealing a face that's as battle-hardened as it is cold. Wolf's movements are swift and predatory as he navigates through the crowd of villagers. His eyes scan the gathered people, searching for a target to make an example of. Without warning, Wolf's hand shoots out, seizing a woman from the crowd. She's young, perhaps in her late twenties, with a face marked by a life of hardship. Her eyes widen in terror as Wolf drags her forward, her feet stumbling over the uneven ground. Tuyette's breath catches in her throat, a strangled cry escaping her lips. No, Chilin, she whispers, her voice breaking. The woman being manhandled is her older sister. The woman's cries are desperate, pleading for mercy in a voice choked with fear. Please don't, please don't, she begs. But Wolf's grip only tightens, his fingers digging into her arm. With a violent jerk, he throws her to the ground. The impact is brutal, her body landing with a sickening thud. Dust billows around her as she struggles to rise, her face contorted in pain. From the terrified crowd, a small child breaks free, a little girl no more than five years old. Her hair is in disarray, her tiny feet bare against the dirt. With tears streaming down her face, she runs towards the woman. Mioi! Mommy! she cries, her voice piercing the tense silence. That's my! Tuyet cries. As the child reaches her mother, wrapping her small arms around her, Wolf grabs the girl by the back of her shirt collar and tosses the her to the side like discarded trash. Lynn screams, a raw, primal sound that cuts through the air. Wolf lifts Lynn up, her legs kicking in a futile attempt to break free. His hand moves to his side, drawing an M1911 pistol. The gun gleams coldly in the sunlight as he presses it against the Lynn's temple. The woman's eyes are wide with uncomprehending fear her sobs choked and quiet. Where are you hiding them? Wolf barks in heavily accented Vietnamese. Speak, or she dies. Lin, her body trembling, stammers in response. Please, I don't know what you're talking about. Please don't hurt me. The Major cocks his pistol. I won't ask again. Where are they? Tuyet, watching helplessly, whispers through gritted teeth. We have to do something, Thon. That's my sister. We can't let him. I agree with her sentiment. But what can we do? We are two against many. The thought of intervening is a dangerous one, a likely suicide mission. Yet doing nothing feels like an even greater crime. As the tension in the village square reaches a feverish peak, an elderly villager steps forward. His gait is unsteady, his back bent with age, but his eyes burn with a defiant fire. Take me instead, he says, his voice raspy but firm. Let the woman go. The Major turns to face the old man, his smirk a cruel twist of lips. For a moment there's a flicker of emotion in his eyes, as if he finds the offer amusing, a brief interlude in his reign of terror. Then without a word he raises his pistol towards the man and fires. The old man collapses, a crimson stain spreading across his shirt. Panic erupts among the villagers. Cries of horror and grief mingle with the wails of the child, still held captive in Wolf's merciless grip. Wolf throws Lynn roughly to the ground beside her daughter, who immediately envelops her in a protective embrace. The girl's sobs are muffled against her mother's chest, her small body shaking with fear. Wolf stands up, surveying the village with a cold detachment. Burn it all, he orders, his voice devoid of emotion. 
Leave no witnesses. The soldiers hesitate, exchanging uneasy glances. The order seems to weigh heavily on some of them, a flicker of humanity in their eyes. But the Major's authority is absolute. His men, trained to follow orders without question, begin the grim task. They move through the village, setting fire to the huts with flamethrowers. The thatch roofs catch quickly, flames licking upwards, consuming the structures in a voracious blaze. The men of the village are forced to one side of the square, their hands bound behind their backs. Their fate is one of bullets to the back of the head and unmarked graves. The women clutching their children are herded into a group. We can see some of the soldiers forcing themselves on the terrified women. They hold them down, their rough hands tearing at their clothes while others watch and laugh. Hearing her niece's cries, Tuyet's instinct to protect her family surges to the forefront. She lurches towards the door, her every muscle tense to spring into action. I grab her arm, pulling her back with all my strength. To yet, no, you'll be killed. She struggles against my hold, her eyes wild with desperation. My family, I can't just... Listen to me, I beg. My voice strained with the effort of restraining her. Rushing out there will only get us both killed. We need to think this through. Our heated whispers are suddenly cut short by a chilling, guttural moan from under a pile of rice sacks in the corner of the hut. Our heads snap towards the sound, our bodies instinctively tensing for a new threat. We approach the corner cautiously, my flashlight's beam cutting through the dimness of the hut. A hand protrudes from under the sacks. It's a ghastly sight, skin charred and blistered, fingers twisted unnaturally. Another moan fills the air, laden with pain and suffering. We gingerly pull away the sacks to reveal a woman, or at least what's left of her. Her body is a horrific patchwork of burns and blistering skin, her features barely recognizable. Thick hemp ropes bind her tightly, digging into her already damaged skin, suggesting she was tied down as a precaution by someone who feared what she had become. Her mouth, a gash of torn flesh and broken teeth, snaps open and closed with savage ferocity. Saliva and blood mix, dribbling down her chin in a grotesque parody of humanity. Tuyet gasps, her face pale with shock. That's... that's Mrs. Thao, the village seamstress, she stutters, her voice trembling. Mrs. Thao, she whispers, reaching out her hand. I grab Tuyet's arm, stopping her. Don't, I warn, my voice tense. She's not the person you knew anymore. Tuyet's eyes fill with tears, but she nods, understanding the harsh reality of our situation. As we stand there, grappling with the grim transformation of Mrs. Tao, a sudden violent commotion erupts outside. The wooden door to the hut shudders under a series of heavy blows. The wood creaks and groans under the assault, splinters flying as the door begins to buckle. Clear the area, breach on my go, a voice commands. In the palpable tension that fills the cramped space of the hut, I lean in close to Tuyet, my voice a whisper. I have an idea, but we need to act fast. I explain my risky plan to her. With a solemn nod, she positions herself by the doorway of the hut. Tuyet takes a deep breath, then shouts towards the door, her voice cracking with feigned helplessness. Dung Ban! Emra Day! Don't shoot, I'm coming out. The soldiers outside respond with a barrage of taunts and obscenities, their voices laced with cruelty and anticipation. Come out, sweetie. Let's see if you're as pretty as you sound, one jeers, his laughter harsh and mocking. Yeah, come show us a good time, another chimes in, his tone dripping with malice. We won't bite, hard. I knew him. I love you. A third commando shouts in broken Vietnamese, giving smoochies. Ignoring their taunts, I grab hold of Mrs. Tao's bindings, guiding her twisted form to face the door. I struggle to hold on to her as she grows more agitated, sensing her impending release. Tuyet, her back against the wall, carefully unlatches the door, keeping her body out of the soldier's line of sight. The door creaks open a sliver, a thin beam of sunlight piercing the gloom of the hut. As the door swings open, the air crackles with tension, a moment frozen in time. The commando's eyes widen in shock as they catch sight of Mrs. Tao. Oh, f one manages to utter. I slacken my grip on Mrs. Tao, she lunges forward with a guttural roar, her charred form a blur of rage and hunger. Her teeth sink into the nearest commando's neck with a vicious ferocity, tearing through flesh and arteries. Blood spurts in a gruesome fountain, painting the air crimson as he collapses. 
his cries gurgling into silence. In the split second of shock that follows the savage attack, Tuyet and I seize the moment. We step forward, rifles raised, opening fire on the stunned soldiers. The soldiers at the doorway are quickly neutralized under our rapid fire, their bodies slumping to the ground. The soldiers at the doorway are quickly neutralized under our rapid fire, their bodies slumping to the ground. We press on, using Mrs. Tao's convulsing body as a shield. The sensation of bullets thudding into her is unnerving. The sudden eruption of violence transforms the scene into one of chaotic carnage. Bullets whiz past, finding targets in flesh and wood alike. We move grimly, our weapons spitting death at the unwitting soldiers. The enemy, recovering from their initial shock, returns fire with disciplined volleys. The villagers, caught in the deadly crossfire, scramble for cover. A young man, barely out of his teens, falls clutching his chest, his eyes wide with disbelief. A mother, her arms shielding her children, darts behind a crumbling wall, her prayers whispered between breaths. We're outnumbered and outgunned, a fact that becomes more apparent with each passing second. Tuyet's face is a mask of determination, but I can see the fear in her eyes. We duck behind a fallen cart, its wood splintered by bullets, offering scant protection. I'll cover you. Move to that building there, I shout to Tuyet, indicating a partially destroyed hut across the way. Her nod is terse, her movement swift as she darts forward under the cover of my gunfire. The firefight intensifies, the enemy's fire becoming more concentrated. Bullets chip away at my fragile cover, sending splinters flying. My magazine runs dry, and I slam in a new one, the click of the magazine home a comforting sound. As Tuyet reaches the relative safety of the hut, she turns and lays down covering fire for me. I make a break for it, sprinting with a speed I didn't know I possessed. Bullets kick up dirt around my feet, a terrifying reminder of how close death is. Reaching the hut, I dive through the doorway, rolling to a stop beside Tuyet. Our respite is fleeting, the illusion of safety shattered as the rhythmic throb of the Huey's rotors grows louder, more insistent. Through the shattered window of the hut, we see the helicopter pivot in the air, its deadly armament aligning with our precarious shelter. The sight of Major Wolf, perched menacingly in the passenger seat, his cold smile chills my blood. His hand motions commandingly, a silent order to his gunner. Huey's minigun swivels towards us, its barrels glinting ominously in the sun. Time slows, each millisecond stretching into eternity as we brace for the storm of bullets, but then the air is split by a different sound, a sharp, piercing whoosh that cuts through the din of battle. A rocket, a thin trail of smoke in its wake, streaks through the air with lethal precision. The Huey, caught off guard, attempts a desperate, evasive maneuver. Too late. The rocket connects with a thunderous impact, engulfing the helicopter in a ball of fire and smoke. Debris scatters, raining down on the battlefield like a deadly hail. In the stunned silence that follows, I turn towards the source of our salvation. There, standing with the spent tube of an M-72 law slung over his shoulder, is Specialist Van, one of my squadmates. His uniform is torn and stained with blood and soot. As I grapple with the shock and relief of seeing him alive, two more figures emerge from the smoke and rubble, weapons at the ready. They're members of my squad, Private First Class Lamb and Private Hung, both of whom I had feared lost. Lamb, his face smeared with grime and blood, brandishes an M-79 grenade launcher. Hung, carrying an extra bandolier of ammunition, moves with a limping gait, evidence of a wound not fully healed. Their arrival turns the tide of the firefight, bolstering our numbers and morale. Without wasting a moment, we coordinate our assault. Lamb positions himself behind a shattered wall, peering through a gap to aim his M-79. With a steady hand, he fires, the grenade launcher's distinct thump echoing through the village. The 40 mm grenade arcs gracefully before detonating amidst a group of commandos attempting to flank us. The explosion sends shrapnel tearing through the ranks of attackers. Horrific screams follow. The battlefield becomes a blur of motion and violence. Hung unleashes a torrent of gunfire from his M60, the belt-fed rounds chattering rapidly as he lays down a blanket of suppressing fire. The commandos, caught in the open, scramble for cover behind a fallen water buffalo its massive body a grotesque shield against our onslaught. Bullets tear through the decaying flesh, sending tufts of fur and a spray of gore into the air. 
I signaled to the others, our eyes meeting with a shared understanding. We split, moving in a coordinated effort to encircle the commandos. As we advance, Lamb takes point on one flank, moving with a silent grace. He spots a commando attempting to reposition. The enemy soldier, unaware of Lamb's approach, is caught off guard as Lamb closes the distance between them. The confrontation is sudden and brutal. Lamb confronts the commando at close range. The commando, surprised, tries to bring his weapon to bear, but it's too late. Lamb's Remington shotgun roars with a deafening blast. The soldier is hit square in the chest, the impact throwing him backward, his life extinguished before he hits the ground. Lamb doesn't pause to watch. He's already moving, scanning for the next threat. As Tuyet and I inch closer, the sound of our adversary's panicked whispers reaches our ears. They huddled behind the buffalo's corpse, unaware of our approach, their attention focused on the direction of Lamb's last known position. We communicate with a series of hand signals, a silent agreement to converge on the enemy from opposite sides. Tuyet nods, her eyes locked on mine for a moment, a shared resolve between us. She circles to the left, moving with a predator's stealth, her SKS cradled in her arms. I take the right flank, my steps deliberate, avoiding the debris that litters the ground. The scent of blood and decay is overwhelming as I draw closer to the buffalo, its bloated body a grim barrier. Reaching the edge of the makeshift cover, I pause, listening. The commando's ragged breathing is audible now. I glance towards Tuyet, finding her position. She's ready, her presence barely noticeable in the chaos around us. Tuyet edges closer, her movements a silent whisper. The commandos, too focused on their immediate front, fail to notice her approach. With the precision of a seasoned hunter, she aligns her sights on one, his head barely peeking above their dubious cover. In a heartbeat, her finger tightens on the trigger of her rifle. A shot rings out. The commando's head snaps back, his body going limp as he slumps to the ground, a life extinguished in the blink of an eye. The remaining commando, sensing the tide turning against him, makes a desperate move. He stands abruptly, revealing his last despicable card. Tuyet's niece, Mai, clutched in his arms, used as a human shield. The child's tears streak through the dirt on her face, her sobs piercing the post-battle silence. Get the fuck back, the commando barks. Aunt Tuyet, Mai cries. Tuyet freezes, her rifle lowering slightly. Don't worry, baby, she calls out gently to Mai. Everything's going to be okay. Her eyes are fixed on the girl, her posture softened by the instinct to protect the innocent. The commando's desperate grip on the child only tightens, his eyes darting wildly, searching for an escape that doesn't exist. At that moment, everything slows down. The American's back is turned to me, his focus entirely on Tuyet and Mai. It's now or never. I inch forward, my movements barely a whisper. The commando's car 15 shakes in his grip, betraying his fear and desperation. As I draw near, his voice cracks. I'll do it, I swear I'll... Tuyet keeps her rifle lowered, her hands spread in a gesture of surrender, her eyes locked on Mai, offering silent reassurance. She's playing her role perfectly, giving our opponent a false sense of security. I'm close now, close enough to hear the ragged edge of fear in the commando's breath, to see the sweat bead on his brow, the tremble of his hold. The final steps I take are the quietest. With a surge of adrenaline, I swing the rifle down with all my might. The butt of the rifle connects with the commando's skull with a sickening crack, a sound that echoes sharply in the sudden silence. The force of the blow sends him stumbling forward, releasing his grip on the girl. The commando collapses to the ground, motionless, a crumpled heap of fabric and flesh. Without hesitation, I kick his weapon away, sending the car 15 skittering across the dirt, far out of his reach. My own rifle remains trained on him, the barrel unwavering. Mai, freed from her captor's grasp, runs towards Tuyet, who sweeps her up in her arms, her eyes wide with relief and fear. Tuyet looks at me, her eyes filled with gratitude. The girl clings to her, her small body shaking with sobs. You're okay, baby, I've got you, she whispers to the child. In the aftermath, the stillness is shattered by the sound of boots crunching on debris. From the smoke, the survivors of my platoon emerge, their weapons trained on Tuyet, the trembling child in her arms. Drop the gun now! Step away from the kid! Lamb barks, his shotgun aimed squarely at Tuyet's head. 
Tuyet, her resolve hardening, sets the child gently on the ground behind her and turns to face the soldiers, her posture defiant. Her rifle, though lowered, remains in her grip. I step forward, placing myself between Tuyet and the survivors of my platoon, my back to her as I face my men. Stand down! My voice is firm, leaving no room for argument. That's an order! Their guns waver but don't lower, suspicion etched deep in their faces. Van's eyes narrow, his grip on his rifle tightening. Bitch is fucking VC, we can't trust her. Tuyet is with me, I say firmly. Thang, what are you doing? Hung challenges. You're on a first-name basis with the enemy now? She saved my life, I exclaim. She what? Hung asks, bewildered. And I saved her life, I add, my voice steady but laced with an urgency that I hope conveys the gravity of what Tuyet and I have been through. We'd be dead without each other, or worse. The men's eyes flick between me and Tuyet, their fingers still tense on their triggers. Tuyet stands her ground, her gaze steady and unflinching. Lamb's voice cuts through the tense silence. And how many of our men did she kill in the ambush? How can you just stand there and defend her? Tuyet's response is a quiet confession, her voice steady despite the weight of her words. Yes, I fought against you. You were the enemy, she admits, her eyes never leaving Lamb's. But the threat we face now, it doesn't care about sides. It's killing everyone, soldiers and civilians alike. Hung, the youngest member of my squad, his face smeared with dirt and streaked with sweat, looks from me to Tuyet and back again. His rifle, previously aimed with unwavering intent, lowers fractionally. If Corporal Thon vouches for you, he says, his voice betraying a flicker of uncertainty, then, then that's good enough for me. I can see Lamb's resolve wavering. I meet Lamb's eyes, my expression earnest. Look around you, Lamb. This isn't about North versus South anymore. What we're facing, it's something else entirely. It doesn't see uniforms or flags. It just destroys. Lamb's eyes still hold a shadow of doubt, but he nods, acknowledging my command. I hope you know what you're doing, Thun, he mutters, his voice a gruff concession to my authority rather than any trust in Tuyet. Van remains the last holdout, his stance rigid, his rifle still aimed at Tuyet. You shitheads are really going to fall for her act? He growls. I meet Van's gaze squarely, my voice steady. It's not an act. You saw her fight beside us. She took down those commandos just as we did. One pretty face, and you've all caught a case of stupid, Van says with contempt. Have you forgotten what her kind did to heap? Van's words hit me like a physical blow the mention of my brother dragging up memories I fought hard to keep at bay. I lock eyes with Van. You think I've forgotten? Every day I carry that with me. But this, this isn't about revenge, it's about survival. Yeah, and I'm going to ensure our survival by blowing her brains out, he counters. You're going to make that little girl watch her aunt get shot, I press, nodding towards the trembling child now clinging to Tuyet's leg, her small face buried in the fabric of Tuyet's trousers. Is that the kind of man you are, Van? What would your daughter think of her father right now? Van's jaw clenches, his gaze shifting between me, Tuyet, and the child. God damn you, Than! The standoff stretches on, a moment frozen in time, as Van wrestles with the implications of his actions. Finally, with a barely audible sigh, Van's stance softens. The tension in his shoulders eases as the rifle lowers, the barrel pointing harmlessly to the ground. As he moves past me, he leans in close, his breath warm against my ear. If she betrays us, I'll shoot both of you myself, Van says, a challenge and promise woven into his words. The air is filled with the acrid smell of gunpowder, wails, and the metallic tang of blood. Tuyet moves among the surviving villagers, offering comfort and assessing injuries with a gentle efficiency. Meanwhile, I signal to my men, directing them towards the unconscious commando sprawled on the ground. His body lies motionless. We approach with caution, aware that the enemy, even in defeat, can still pose a danger. Van and Hung secure the commando's arms behind his back, using the remnants of his belt to bind his wrists. As they do, I notice the disturbing trophy that adorns his neck. A necklace made of human ears, their edges frayed and bloodied. A visceral disgust churns in my stomach. Fuck, Lamb exclaims. Who would do something like this? A monster, that's who, Van says, spitting on the ground. I take a look at our captive's face. 
I'm struck by how young he looks, barely out of his teens. I can't help but wonder, what series of events led him to this moment? What could compel someone so young to embrace such darkness? I hold up his dog tags, flipping them over in my hands. The cold metal feels heavy, engraved with the name Elijah Wright. I begin to search his pockets, methodical and thorough. Aside from a few crumpled bills, a Zippo lighter, and a small baggie of black tar heroin, there's little of interest until my fingers close around a small, worn photograph. Pulling it out, the image that greets me is striking. It's right, his arms wrapped around a young woman in an embrace. They're smiling, lost in a moment of joy. It strangely humanizes him. As we turn our prisoner over to check for concealed weapons, I catch sight of a tattoo on his bicep. It's a macabre image, a smiling skull, blood dripping from its jaws, adorned with a green beret. The letters Mac V. Sog are inked in bold underneath. It's the name of a shadowy organization I've only heard whispered about in hushed tones. Rumored to be directly run by the American CIA, their operations are the stuff of ghost stories among the rank and file. Missions deep into enemy territory, assassination squads, psychological warfare that know no bounds. The brutality and heartlessness of their actions are nightmare fuel, even among those of us accustomed to the horrors of war. Staring at the tattoo, the realization dawns on us. This young man isn't just any soldier, he's part of something far more sinister, an operative trained to sow terror and death without remorse. We need to figure out our next move, I say, breaking the silence. My eyes scan the faces of my squad. Despite their exhaustion, a resolve shines through. Van, his usual abrasiveness softened by the gravity of the situation, nods. We can't go rushing into things. We need intel. Lamb interjects. And then what? What can we possibly do? Do you expect us to take on the U.S. military? Before I can respond to Lamb, Tuyet approaches her expression grim. Beside her is a frail woman, her eyes brimming with unshed tears. This is Mrs. Ha, Tuyet introduces. Her son Luke was taken by men dressed like the ones we've just fought. Mrs. Ha's voice trembles as she speaks, her hands clasped tightly together as if holding on to hope itself. He's just a boy, she pleads, her voice breaking with emotion. They came at dawn, took him. Please, you must help me find him. Mai, still visibly shaken, clings to her aunt's leg, her small frame trembling. Tuyet kneels down to her level, her voice a soothing whisper, trying to coax her niece into sharing what she saw. It's okay, Mai. You're safe now. Can you tell us what happened to Luke? Her voice is barely above a whisper, her words fragmented by fear. We were... we were fetching water. From the stream, she begins, her eyes darting around as if the memory itself could bring the terror back to life. And then... Then they came. Who came, I press. Through her sobs, Mai explains how they were ambushed. A smiling man came. He grabbed Luke, she manages to say. I hid. I hid behind the rocks. They didn't see me. Did you see where they took him, Mai? I ask, keeping my voice gentle, not wanting to push her too hard. Mai shakes her head, fresh tears brimming in her eyes. No, I was scared. I stayed hidden until they were gone. I'm sorry. It's okay, sweetie. You were very brave. Tuyet pulls her niece into a tight embrace, her eyes meeting mine over the girl's head. Please, you must help me find him, Mrs. Ha, please. We'll do everything we can to find your son, Tuyet declares. Won't we, Thun? Lamb furrows his brow. How can we? We wouldn't even know where to start. He might know something, I say, gesturing to our captive. We pull right into a nearby hut, surprisingly intact amid the ruins. Inside, the dim, tense air fills our lungs. We tie him securely to a chair. His head stoops forward, unconsciousness clinging to him like a shadow. I find a bucket of water outside, the liquid cold and indifferent. I splash it over Wright's face, the shock of it cutting through his stupor. He jerks awake, sputtering, his eyes wild and unfocused until they settle on us. Even bound and captured, there's a defiance in his gaze, a smoldering ember of resistance. The young commando jolts awake, coughing and spluttering, his eyes darting around wildly as he realizes his predicament. Wright's initial reaction is pure instinct, 
a desperate yet futile attempt to free himself from the constraints that bind him to the wooden chair. I position myself directly in front of him. My English is rough, pieced together from interactions with American advisors, and heavily skewed towards military jargon. But it's marginally the best. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. You've made a huge fucking mistake, he spits out, his voice laced with venom. I'm not the one hogtied to a chair, I retort. Wright chuckles, a sound devoid of humor. You think you're in control here? You have no idea what you're up against. Clue us in, then, I press, my voice a low growl of barely restrained anger. You're playing with fire, boy, he sneers, the corners of his mouth twitching into a disdainful smirk. I ignore his threat. Where did your men take the village boy, Luke? Go fuck yourself, he replies, the words dripping with contempt. The moment hangs suspended, a standoff of wills. I reach for the pack of cigarettes tucked into my shirt pocket, drawing one out with deliberate slowness. The flick of the lighter casts a brief glow. I take a long drag, the smoke swirling in the air between us. Exhaling slowly, I watch Wright's defiant gaze. Then, without warning, I press the burning cigarette against his exposed forearm. The smell of burning flesh mingles with the tobacco smoke. You'll have to do better than that, he gasps through gritted teeth. I nod slightly towards my men, an unspoken understanding between soldiers. Van steps forward, a twisted grin spreading across his face. He casually adjusts the heavy ring on his finger. Then, in a movement as swift as it is brutal, he drives his fist into the commando's jaw. The sound of impact is sickening. Blood splatters and several teeth scatter across the floor. The commando slumps in his chair, groaning. We can keep going, I tell him, all night if we have to. Wright coughs, a spatter of blood staining the dirt floor. He tries to laugh, a hoarse grating sound that ends in a wince. I ain't saying shit to a bunch of peasants playing at soldiers. Your choice, I say coldly. Van, his patience frayed to its limits, lands another blow to Wright's midsection. The sound, a dull thud, echoes in the cramped space, mingling with the captive's ragged breaths. Wright doubles over as much as his bindings allow, a groan escaping his lips. Lamb, usually the more composed of us, steps in with a calculated iciness. He delivers a kick to Wright's ribs, the dull thud echoing through the hut. The commando's body jerks, a sharp intake of breath the only indication of his pain. I glance at Hung, who's been standing back, a storm brewing in his young eyes. Hung, it's your turn, I say my voice steady, but with an edge that leaves no room for argument. Me? he asks sheepishly. No, your grandfather. Yes, you, I say, irritated. With a reluctant step forward, Hung raises his fist. His punch lands on Wright's shoulder, a half-hearted attempt that barely elicits a reaction from the commando. I lock eyes with Hung, my gaze disapproving. Harder, I instruct, my voice a mix of command and encouragement. Hung's eyes flicker to me, a hint of irritation in their depths. He draws back his fist again, this time with a bit more force. The punch lands with a better sound but still lacks conviction. I glare at Hung, disappointment sharp in my eyes. Is that all you've got? You hit like a bitch. Look at him, he's laughing at you. Something shifts in Hung's expression, a shadow passing over his features. The next moment he's a blur of motion, his fist connecting with Wright's face with a force that has the chair rocking back. The sound of impact is sharp, definitive. Hung doesn't stop there. Another punch, then another, each blow landing with increased ferocity. His pent-up rage, the frustration and fear of the past days, seem to fuel him. Wright is at Hung's mercy. After an hour of relentless interrogation, Wright is bloodied and bruised, yet his defiance remains unbroken. His face is a mess of cuts and swelling, Yet he manages to smirk through the pain, taunting us with a cruelty that chills the bone. You're just dogs chasing after scraps. You have no idea what's coming for you. He spits in my face to add an extra layer of insult. Something inside me snaps, the calculated restraint I've held on to evaporating. Without a word, my hand shoots out, clamping around Wright's throat with a grip tighter than iron. I drag him out of the hut, his legs scraping against the ground. Tuyet intercepts me as I emerge into the dwindling light of day. Did you get anything from him? she asks, trying to catch my eyes. 
I don't answer, my mind racing, consumed by a singular thought. Where's Mrs. Tao? I ask, my voice rough, almost unrecognizable to my own ears. Tuyet hesitates, her eyes searching mine for a moment before she nods, understanding the urgency in my voice. She leads the way through the devastated hamlet, past huts that are little more than charred skeletons of what they once were. She guides me to a structure on the outskirts of the hamlet, its silhouette ominous against the fading light. The interior of the structure is dimly lit by a single oil lamp, casting long shadows that dance along the walls. The air is thick, suffocating, laced with the iron scent of blood that clings to the back of my throat. The floor is stained dark, a patchwork of dried blood. Chains hang from the ceiling. In the corner a collection of tools lies scattered on a wooden table. Knives, pliers, a hammer with a handle worn from use. We walk past the grim aftermath of today's massacre. The bodies of victims lay side by side, their lifeless eyes staring into nothingness, each face etched with the terror of their last moments. Beyond the human tragedy, a row of slaughtered pigs hangs from meat hooks, their carcasses gutted and lifeless. As I move past the pigs, a sudden sound halts me in my tracks, a shuffling, a soft, wet dragging. My heart pounds against my ribs, each beat a thunderous echo in the oppressive silence. I raise my flashlight, its beam slicing through the darkness, searching for the source of the movement. And then I see her. Dangling from a hook among the pigs is Mrs. Tao, her body a horror show of gaping bullet wounds and torn flesh. Her head snaps to attention at our presence, the chains that bind her to the hook rattling in a sinister melody. Her mouth opens wide, revealing a maw of broken teeth and blackened gums, eager to rend and tear. I turn back to right, my expression hardened by the horrors I've witnessed. Do you even know their names? I ask him, my voice steady despite the rage boiling inside me. The people you've terrorized, the lives you've destroyed, do they mean anything to you? I turn to Tuyet, signaling her to step closer. Tell him their names. Tuyet swallows hard, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. She begins, her voice steady but filled with a profound sadness. This is Nguyen Ngok Lan, mother of three. She was trying to protect her children when your men gunned her down. Her voice breaks, but she presses on. Fam Min Koa, just seven years old. He was hiding in the rice paddy, too scared to cry out. You found him anyway. Here are Lejia Bao and his little sister Quinn Dao. Bao was teaching Quinn how to read when your helicopters first appeared. They never had a chance to run. Bui Hua Bin, he survived wars and famines. He died standing up for my sister. Ending with Mrs. Tao, Tuyet's voice is a whisper laden with grief. And Tran Tao Vai, she made the best Bon Sio in the village. Now look at her. I step closer to write, my voice low but filled with an intensity that commands attention. You did this. Every name she mentioned, every life you've ruined, it's on you and your men. My men, sensing the shift in my intentions, grasp right firmly, pinning him against his chair. Their grips are ironclad, allowing no room for resistance. The commando's eyes flicker with a hint of fear for the first time, a realization dawning that his situation has taken a darker turn. I approach Mrs. Tao, her undead form bound by the chains that dangle from the ceiling, the twisted parody of life that animates her now is a horror beyond words. With a deep breath I grasp the chain above her, pulling her closer to right. Her movements become more frantic, the scent of living flesh driving her into a frenzy. Her chains rattle as she strains towards him, her hunger palpable. Yo, what the fuck are you doing, man? Wright gasps, his voice cracking. Talk, I say, my voice cold and steady. Tell us where they took the boy or she starts eating, feet first. You can't be serious, right, stammers. Just try me, I respond, my tone ice cold, betraying no hint of bluff. With deliberate slowness, I bring Mrs. Tao closer, her jaws snapping centimeters from his face, putrid drool dripping on his face. The commando's earlier defiance evaporates, replaced by a primal fear. Okay, okay, he gasps, desperation cracking his voice. I'll talk, just, just keep that thing away from me. With a firm grip I pull on the chain, drawing Mrs. Tao back slightly, her gnashing teeth still snapping hungrily in the air. Start talking, now, I press, my voice a razor's edge of urgency. 
He swallows hard, his resolve crumbling under the weight of his predicament. There's a facility, deep in the jungle. It's run by the CIA, he stammers, the words tumbling out in a rush. About twenty clicks northeast of here, by the Thuban River. That's where they bring in the subjects, he explains, the last word a whisper of horror. Subjects? What subjects? I ask. He hesitates, his gaze flickering to Mrs. Thao before returning to me. Criminals, POWs, villagers, anyone they can grab. They're using them as test subjects for their experiments. I nod to Lamb, who quickly unfolds a topographical map on the ground in front of us. The creased map is smeared with dirt and stained with sweat. I drag Wright's chair closer, positioning him over the map. The base, pointed out, I demand. With his arms bound and his body racked with pain, Wright leans forward as much as the ropes allow, his nose hovering over the map. A droplet of blood oozing from a gash on his forehead falls, marking the map. The blood stain blooms on the paper, a crimson mark that signifies our target. There, Wright whispers. I scrutinize the marked area. How do we bypass the base's defenses? Wright shakes his head, a bitter laugh escaping his lips. You don't get it. This place, it's not just guarded. It's designed to be a goddamn fortress. They've got perimeter patrols with shoot-to-kill orders, motion sensors, mines in the surrounding jungle. Even the strongest fortress has weak points, I say, my voice low, as I pull Mrs. Tao closer to help jog his memory. Her snarls grow louder, more desperate. Wait, wait, Wright blurts out, panic edging his voice as he watches the undead form of Mrs. Tao inch closer, her teeth snapping in anticipation. There might be a way, but it's a long shot, a one in a million. I hand the reins over to Hung who tightens his grip on the chain, holding Mrs. Tao at bay. Explain, I demand. He swallows hard, his eyes darting between Mrs. Tao and me. There's a drainage system. Runs underneath the compound, empties into the river. They use it for, for runoff. Chemicals, waste. It's guarded, but not as heavily. Everyone's focused on the jungle. Where's the entrance? I ask, my mind racing, trying to piece together a plan from the fragments he's offering. Slowly, painstakingly, he nudges his head forward, indicating a spot on the map with the tip of his nose. Here. The entrance is concealed. You'd miss it if you weren't looking for it. But even if you manage to sneak past the guards at the drainage system, what's inside the base is far worse, he adds, his voice a mix of fear and warning. I lean in, my interest piqued. What's inside? Wright shakes his head, a haunted look in his eyes. I wasn't authorized to go into those areas, but I had to dispose of the failed experiments. His admission sends a chill down my spine. I press him for details. What failed experiments? He shudders, closing his eyes as if to block out the memories. Things, not human anymore. Some were dead but not dead. Others, twisted, screaming. They were trying to weaponize them, use them against Charlie. But some, they couldn't control. I stand up, processing the information. Around me, my companions exchange grave looks. Who is the smiling man? I ask directly, my tone neutral yet firm. Wright's confusion is evident as his brow furrows, clearly caught off guard by the question. It takes him a moment, but recognition slowly dawns in his eyes. I've only heard the name, he confesses, his voice a low murmur. Never met the man. But they say he's the brains behind this whole operation, obsessed with perfecting Agent Indigo. Agent Indigo? I echo. What is that? Some kind of weapon? Agent Indigo. It's not just a weapon, it's something worse, Wright says, his voice barely above a whisper. Something that can bring back the dead. Make them like her. He nods toward Mrs. Tao, his voice thick with revulsion. I take a moment to reflect on what he said. Wright's bloodshot eyes meet mine, a flicker of something resembling acceptance passing through them. You gonna kill me now, boss? His voice is devoid of its earlier bravado, replaced by a weary resignation. I hold his gaze, the weight of his question heavy in the air between us. If the roles were reversed, would you let me go? He laughs, a hollow sound that echoes off the walls of the hut. Hell nah, I'd fill your ass with lead before you could take ten paces. I nod the grim truth of his words settling over us like a shroud. Even if I wanted to let him go, I couldn't. He'd warn the others we were coming. Then you know what I have to do. Wright's expression hardens, the reality of his situation fully dawning on him. 
He stares at the dirt floor, then back up at me. Just make it quick then, bro. A bullet right here. He tilts his head slightly, indicating a spot between his eyes, a grim acceptance in his gesture. The room is thick with tension, the air punctuated by the incessant guttural gnarls of Mrs. Tao. Each sound she makes is a reminder of the horror that Wright and his kind have unleashed upon us. The sound burrows deep, igniting a seething hatred that festers in my chest, a dark burning rage that I can no longer contain. You know, in my culture they say the dead don't rest, I tell him, my voice firm. Not until justice has been served, not until they've had their fill of vengeance. I take the chain from Hung, my hands steady despite the turmoil churning inside me. As I pull Mrs. Tao closer to Wright, her movements grow more hectic, an anticipation in her snarls. Wright's defiant facade crumbles, giving way to raw, unmasked fear. His eyes, wide with terror, dart from Mrs. Tao to me and back again, pleading silently for a mercy that's no longer mine to give. No, please. With a steady hand, I release the chain stepping back as Mrs. Tao lunges forward. Wright's screams fill the hut, a symphony that cuts through the silence like a knife. Mrs. Tao tears into him with a savage hunger, her teeth sinking deep into flesh and bone. Without a word to each other, we turn our backs on the scene, stepping out of the hut into the fading light of day. As I step outside, Wright's cries haunt the air. I try to detach, to distance myself from the horror unfolding just steps away. My feet carry me farther, yet his screams anchor me to that spot, a tether to the darkest depths. My footsteps are heavy, each one echoing the pounding in my head, a rhythmic beat that I try to match by humming a tune, any melody that might drown out the cries. The notes falter, die on my lips as Wright's cries take a turn, morphing into sobs. Mom, please help me, he gasps, the words slicing through the armor I've built around my heart. It's too much. The line between justice and cruelty blurs, and I find myself staggering back towards the hut, propelled by a force I can't name. My hand finds the grip of my M16 as if of its own accord. The sight that greets me is one of pure carnage. Mrs. Tao, or what she's become, is hunched over right, her hands buried deep in his open abdomen. She's chewing on his entrails, pulling at the sinew and flesh with a gruesome eagerness. His eyes meet mine, a silent plea in their fading light. I raise my weapon, my hands steady despite the chaos of my thoughts. With a breath that feels like it carries the weight of the world, I squeeze the trigger. The bullet finds its mark, piercing through his skull. The impact is instantaneous. Mrs. Tao continues her macabre feast, oblivious to her meal's death. My rifle shifts towards her, the sight aligned with her head. My finger hesitates on the trigger. I just don't have it in me to shoot her. Then, without warning, a gunshot pierces the air, sharp and definitive. Mrs. Tao's head explodes in a shower of viscous black fluid, her body slumping lifelessly atop rights. I whirl around, my heart racing to find Tuyet standing behind me, her rifle smoking. Tears carve tracks through the dirt and blood on her face. The rifle slips from her fingers, clattering to the ground as her hands cover her face. I move towards her, closing the distance with a few quick steps. Wrapping my arms around her, I pull her into a tight embrace. She collapses against me, her body racked with sobs. Her grief presses down on us both. I couldn't let her. I couldn't. She whispers between sobs. I know. I know. I hush her, rocking her in my arms. The dusk settles over the village with a heavy silence, broken only by the occasional distant cry or soft murmur. We gather around a smoldering fire its light casting long shadows that dance across our faces, each of us lost in thought. Lamb breaks the silence, his voice heavy with doubt. Are we seriously considering this? Marching into a CIA black site? This is suicide. Even if we make it inside, what then? We're outgunned, outnumbered. Hung, ever the optimist, chimes in. Why not go up the chain of command? Report this to our superiors, to President Thieu, even. They can't possibly condone what's happening here. I shake my head, the bitterness of my laugh surprising even me. You think the CIA is doing this without Thieu's knowledge or even his blessing? We go to our commanders with this and we'll be silenced before sunrise. The weight of our isolation settles in. It's Van who breaks it, his voice a low growl. Then let's hit the fuckers where it hurts. Those bastards massacred our men. 
left us for those things, I say we give them a taste of their own medicine. Lamb finally nods with a heavy sigh. Fine, he concedes, but we're not going there to play heroes. We find the boy and we get out. That's it. No detours, no vengeance runs. His eyes meet each of ours in turn. One by one we nod, an unspoken pact formed in the firelight. Hung frowns as he checks his ammunition. If we're doing this, we're going to need a hell of a lot more firepower than what we've got, he mutters. Tuyet, who had been quiet up until now, stands abruptly. I can help with that. Without waiting for a response, she strides away from the fire, motioning for us to follow. She leads us through the remnants of the village, her silhouette a ghostly figure against the backdrop of destruction. A dilapidated hut looms ahead, its structure a skeleton of what it once was. The roof sags dangerously, and the walls are pockmarked with bullet holes. Tuyet pauses at the entrance, her hand resting on the frame. With a determined push, she opens the door, revealing the dark interior. A musty smell, the scent of earth and decay, wafts out, greeting us like an old, unwelcome friend. We step inside, our eyes adjusting to the darkness, the beam of a single flashlight cutting through the shadows. Tuyet heads to the far corner of the hut. She kneels, brushing away layers of dirt and debris, revealing a trapdoor hidden beneath. With a grunt of effort, she pulls it open, unveiling a narrow staircase that descends down. We follow her down, the air growing cooler as we descend. The staircase ends in a cavernous space, the walls lined with shelves that groan under the weight of their cargo. Our flashlight beams dance across crates stamped with Cyrillic and Chinese characters. Tuyet doesn't hesitate, prying open the nearest crate with a crowbar she brought along, revealing an arsenal of neatly arranged AK-47S. The other crates are filled with a gorilla's treasure trove. RPD light machine guns, RPG-7S, and crates of ammunition sit alongside boxes of grenades and satchels of explosives. Lamb whistles lowly, impressed despite himself. God damn, these were meant for a different fight, she says with a hint of irony. But they'll do the job. In the flickering shadows of the hut, we set about our grim task with a silent efficiency. The air is thick with the smell of oil and metal as we inspect and load the weapons. Tuyet demonstrates the use of an RPG to Hung, who watches intently, nodding his understanding. Lam and Van are hunched over a map spread on the floor, plotting our approach with meticulous care. I stumble upon a small box slightly separated from the others, its contents obscured by a thick layer of dust. I wipe off the dust and pry the lid open, revealing a Makarov pistol nestled within its confines, alongside a spare magazine and a worn leather holster. I eject the magazine, checking it, before sliding it back in with a satisfying click. I thread my belt through the holster, securing the semi-automatic at my side. We paint our faces with camo colors. The green, brown, and black streaks hide our features and blend us into the jungle's heart. We'll move under the cover of darkness, I declare, tracing a route with my finger. Avoid the main paths. They'll be expecting that. Van nods in agreement, his eyes scanning the terrain marked on the map. We'll need to be silent. No gunfire unless absolutely necessary. We gather the villagers at the mouth of the tunnel. Their possessions, meager remnants of shattered lives, are bundled in makeshift carriers. The children clutch tightly to their parents' hands their small figures shadowed in the dimming light. Tuye steps forward, her figure bathed in the soft glow of the lanterns we've handed out, her voice steady as she addresses the huddled masses. We're going to do everything we can to bring back Luke and to put an end to this horror, she says, her eyes reflecting the flicker of the lantern light. But if we don't return in forty-eight hours, I need you to head to my son. The village is a day's trek to the west. It's your best chance at finding safety. Under the cover of a moonless night, we set off towards the heart of darkness. The jungle around us is alive with unseen creatures, their eyes glinting in the darkness, watching our every move. We can almost feel the presence of the undead, lurking just beyond our sight, drawn by the scent of the living. The soft murmur of the Thuban River guides our path. As we draw closer to the drainage system, I signal for a halt, crouching low behind a thicket the rest of the team mirroring my actions. Through my binoculars, the drainage system looms ahead, its entrance obscured by overgrown foliage, 
a dark maw waiting to swallow us whole. A lone guard tower stands sentinel over the entrance, its silhouette stark against the starlit sky. The solitary figure of a sentry, manning a .50 caliber machine gun, is visible. His posture is relaxed, unaware of the eyes trained on him from the shadows. Tuyet slips forward, finding her position, a natural hollow that offers both a clear line of sight and camouflage. She settles in, her breathing controlled, waiting for the right moment. She carefully shoulders her SKS, her fingers making precise adjustments to the scope. The distant thrum of a CH-47 Chinook approaches, its heavy blades cutting through the air with a sound like rolling thunder. Tuyet's eyes narrow, her focus absolute as she aligns her sight with the oblivious sentry. As the Chinook flies overhead, its noise overwhelming the jungle's nocturnal chorus, she exhales and squeezes the trigger. The shot is muffled by the helicopter's roar. The sentry collapses without a sound, his body slumping in the tower, unseen and unheard. We fan out, shadows melding with the darkness. Our movements are specters on the wind. Van moves with a predator's grace, his steps barely disturbing the underbrush as he advances towards a small outpost, a flicker of light betraying the presence of another sentry. The guard is a young man lost in the monotony of his watch. Unaware, he steps outside, a cigarette dangling from his lips. Van waits, patient as stone, until the guard's back is turned. With a swift motion, he closes the distance, his hand clamping over the guard's mouth, stifling any cry as his other hand drives a combat knife deep into the sentry's chest. Van's blade finds its mark again and again. The guard collapses, his blood a dark stain on the earth. Lamb and Hung, operating as a pair, advance towards another vantage point their movements synchronized. They come upon a sentry with his pants down urinating, oblivious to the danger creeping up behind him. Lamb signals to Hung, a silent command that is received with a nod. Hung circles wide, flanking the sentry, while Lamb prepares his garret, a lethal length of piano wire. Lamb strikes, the wire snaking around the sentry's neck, pulling tight. The guard's hands claw at his throat, desperate for air that won't come, his struggles futile against Lamb's relentless grip. Hung is there to support, ensuring their victim makes not a sound as he's eased to the ground. Meanwhile, Tuyet and I move towards the drainage system entrance. The entrance is guarded by one last sentry. His posture lacks. Tuye motions for me to hold, her eyes scanning the area for any unseen threats. Satisfied, she nods, and we proceed. I take the lead, my knife ready, the metal cool and reassuring in my grip. The guard, lost in thought, whistles a tune to keep the oppressive silence at bay. With a swift, practiced motion, I'm upon him, my blade finding the soft flesh beneath his ribcage. He gasps, a sound choked off by my hand over his mouth, his body tensing in shock and pain. Tuyet is beside me, holding him down. It's over quickly, the guard struggles ceasing as his life ebbs away, his body gently slumping to the ground. With the perimeter sentries dispatched, our path to the drainage system is clear. The smell of sewage and decay wafts out to greet us. Our lights pierce the darkness, revealing a tunnel that stretches into the bowels of the earth, its walls slick with moisture and growths that seem to pulse with a life of their own. We enter the water with a collective hesitation, the liquid cold and vile against our skin. It rises quickly, from ankle to waist high, a foul brew that clings to us, seeking to infiltrate every pore, every opening. The beam of my flashlight dances across the surface, revealing ripples that are not of our making. Suddenly Van stops short, his light fixed on a shape that floats in the murky water ahead. It's a grotesque mockery of a human form, bloated and disfigured, its skin a patchwork of decay and unnatural growths. The face, if it can still be called that, is full of gaping orifices and bulging, unseeing eyes. A collective gasp escapes us. My hand finds Tuyet's, my grip tight. Keep moving, I whisper. Don't look at it, just keep moving. As we navigate farther into the tunnel, our lights revealing more ghastly nightmares. One figure, half submerged, its limbs twisted at impossible angles, reaches towards us with fingers that are too long, too jointed. Another, its torso split open to reveal a cavity writhing with what looks like eels, floats past us, borne by the gentle current of the sewer. The faintest hint of light signals the tunnel's end. Our pace quickens, each step a splash in the vile water. The light grows, 
not the welcoming glow of salvation, but an artificial harshness that chills the soul. We reach the source, a rusted ladder leading up to a heavy metal hatch. With a collective effort, we push it open, emerging into a new circle of hell. The air hits us first, a sterile, chemical scent that masks the stench of death and decay. Fluorescent lights flicker overhead, casting an unforgiving glow. As we move through the laboratory, our lights reveal more of the twisted experiments. A cage of rats, their bodies elongated and limbs multiplied, scurry in a mad, never-ending dance. Another holds what might once have been a dog, now a mass of fur and teeth, its bark a guttural, unsettling sound that echoes off the walls. But it's the largest cage that holds our rapt, terrified attention. Inside, a creature of such monstrous proportions and bizarre mutations that it takes me a moment to recognize it as an elephant. Its hide is a canvas of tumors and growths, eyes bulging. One limb ends not in a foot but in a mass of tentacles, wriggling and twitching as if sensing our presence. Its trunk, split down the middle, reveals rows of sharp, jagged teeth. The elephant's gaze meets ours, a flicker of intelligence, of suffering. A sound, half trumpet, half scream, fills the lab. We press on without pausing. The hallway leads us to a heavy steel door, its surface marred by scratches. Van takes point, his hand steady as he eases the door open. Our flashlights scan the space, revealing tables laden with surgical tools, their metal surfaces stained with blood. In the center of the room, suspended from chains that dig cruelly into its flesh, is a figure so grotesquely transformed that it's barely human anymore. The man's ribs are splayed open like the wings of a macabre angel, his internal organs exposed to the stale air of the lab. Among the viscera, a heart beats with a steady, haunting rhythm. The figure's tongue and lower jaw are missing, leaving a gaping chasm that silently screams of unspeakable agony. His eyes are hidden behind blood-soaked blindfolds. A subtle movement catches our eye. The figure's head, barely held aloft by the sinew and remnants of muscle that cling to his skeletal frame, begins to nod. At first it seems like a spasm, a reflex of the tortured flesh. But as we watch, frozen in a mix of horror and pity, a pattern emerges. Morse code. Kill me, the nods spell out over and over again. In the far corner of the lab, a small dimly lit cage draws our attention. As we approach, the soft whimpering of a child pierces the heavy silence. Inside, a young boy huddles in the shadows, his small form curled into a ball. It's Luke staring back at us through the bars. Luke recoils as we near, his sobs cutting through the sterile air. Tuye steps forward, her expression softening as she kneels before the cage. Luke, it's me, Auntie Tuyette. We're here to take you home, she says, her words soothing, patient. We need to leave this place and we need your help. Can you be very quiet for us? I notice that the walls of his cage are covered in crude drawings, the shaky lines of a child's hand depicting scenes of unimaginable horror. Among them, one drawing stands out, a figure with a disturbingly wide smile, its eyes empty circles that seem to follow us as we move. Luke sees what I'm looking at and whispers, his voice trembling, the smiling man, he comes at night. Lamb's urgent whisper tears me away from the chilling drawing. We need to get Luke out of there now. I assess the lock on Luke's cage, a heavy-duty padlock beyond our means to pick. The sudden clamor from the adjacent room heightens our urgency. A voice, cold and authoritative, cuts through. Destroy everything, check the labs, every subject must be eliminated. Leave no evidence of Project Grim Harvest. Hung moves closer to the door and peeks a glimpse through. He turns back to us, signaling with his hand, three fingers up, then a fist, indicating at least thirty hostiles moving our way. The lab is suddenly alive with the sound of gunfire as the soldiers start executing the test subjects. As the clamor of gunfire grows closer, I motion to the team to find cover. The screams of the dying, the sound of bodies hitting the floor, echo in our ears as we press ourselves into the shadows, our breaths held, our weapons clutched in anticipation. The door bursts open and a group of soldiers, their boots thudding against the tiled floor, storm into the room. They sweep the area, rifles at the ready, their eyes missing our hidden forms by mere centimeters. Behind them, a meek-looking man in a blood-stained white lab coat follows, clutching a clipboard to his chest as if it were a lifeline. 
as the soldiers spread out, methodically going through each cage and shooting its occupant, we position ourselves for an ambush. Van's hand tightens on the trigger of his RPD, his eyes tracking the soldiers as they move closer, unaware of the storm that awaits them. Beside him, Lam and Hung are statues carved from the shadows. Tuyet's gaze meets mine across the cold steel of the autopsy table, her eyes a calm sea. I give the signal, and in unison we unleash hell on them. Van's RPD roars to life. The bullets tear through the first line of soldiers, their bodies jerking and collapsing as the rounds find their marks. Lam and Hung follow suit, their AKs barking in short, controlled bursts. The soldiers, caught off guard, scramble for cover, returning fire in a panicked, disorganized fashion. Their shots ricochet off the metal surfaces, sparks dancing in the air like deadly fireflies. Tuyet picks off a soldier trying to flank us. I step forward, my AK steady in my hands. Squeezing the trigger, I unleash a volley of bullets towards a soldier aiming at her. The man falls, his rifle clattering to the ground. The man in the lab coat, frozen in shock, watches as his men are cut down one by one. As the last soldier falls, his eyes wide with terror, he turns to flee, only to find me blocking his path. With a swift movement, I knock the clipboard from his grasp, sending papers fluttering like doves in a breeze. He stumbles backward, tripping over the body of a fallen soldier. I grab him by the collar of his lab coat, kicking him to the ground with a thud that knocks the air from his lungs. Don't shoot me, please, he pleads for mercy. Open the cage, I command, my voice leaving no room to defiance. His eyes dart from me to the small barred enclosure holding Luke, then to the control panel mounted on the wall nearby. Nodding frantically, he scrambles to his feet. I release my grip, allowing him just enough freedom to move towards the panel. His hand shaking hovers over the device, hesitating. Now, I growl. With a resigned sigh, he presses his palm against the scanner. The panel beeps, a green light blinking in confirmation. A series of clicks echoes through the room as the lock on Luke's cage disengages. Tuye rushes to the cage. She swings the door open, crouching to meet Luke's gaze at his level. It's okay, Luke. You're safe now, she whispers, extending her hand. The boy hesitates for a heartbeat before launching himself into her arms. As Tuyet comforts Luke, I turn back to the scientist. What did you do to him? I ask, my tone icy. The scientist's voice trembles as he speaks, his gaze not meeting mine. He... He was part of the control group. He wasn't subjected to the treatments. I narrow my eyes, the anger simmering within me. Control group? Yes, he stammers, pushing his glasses up his nose with a shaky hand. In any experiment, you need a baseline, a group that receives a placebo to measure against those that do. God damn it, what does that mean, I demand. It means he's... he's unharmed, physically, he clarifies. My grip on the scientist tightens, every muscle in my body coiled, ready to execute him on the spot for the horrors he's complicit in. As I draw back my arm, the sound of heavy boots coming freezes me in place. We're cut off our planned escape route. The scientist, sensing my hesitation, seizes his chance. Wait, I can get you out, but you need me alive. His eyes dart towards the door, then back to me. We're trapped, the way we came now swarming with hostiles. Talk, I hiss, pressing the barrel of my rifle against his forehead. There's a secondary exit, he stammers, a service tunnel used for equipment transport. It's hidden behind the lab through the cold storage. But it's secured. Biometric locks. Without me, you'll never get through. Lamb interjects, his voice low. We can't trust him. We don't have much of a choice, I counter, weighing our dire options. Move, I bark, forcing the scientist to lead the way. Tuyet, clutching Luke close, falls in step behind me, her gaze sweeping the room for any further threats. Van and Hung provide rear cover, their rifles trained on the path behind us. The scientist, a quivering mass, scuttles ahead, his lab coat a ghostly banner in the artificial light. We follow as a silent phalanx. The sound of approaching footsteps echoes ominously. Suddenly, the scientist lets out a shrill cry that pierces the tense silence. Help! Here! Over here! In an instant, the element of surprise is torn from our grasp, leaving us exposed and vulnerable. Without a second thought, I grab the scientist, pulling him back against my chest, my arm a vice around his neck. The muzzle of my rifle presses coldly against his side. The soldiers, alerted by the scientist's cry, 
round the corner, their weapons raised, ready to engage. Back off, I shout, or he dies. The soldiers, momentarily frozen by my threat, exchange wary glances, their fingers hovering over their triggers. From behind the ranks, a captain steps forward, his gaze cold and calculating. His voice cuts through the standoff. Open fire, he commands. Instinct takes over. I shove the scientist forward, using the fleeting distraction to dive for cover behind a sturdy, overturned table. The scientist, caught in the open and defenseless, is hit with a hail of lead. His body jerks violently as round after round rips through him. In moments, he's reduced to nothing more than a lifeless heap on the floor. Tuyette, hunkered down beside me, keeps Luke pressed tightly against her, her body a protective barrier for the boy. Lam and Hung, positioned on our flanks, return fire with short bursts. The captain signals his men to advance. They move as a single unit, a relentless force bearing down on us. As we exchange fire with the advancing soldiers, a sudden shout slices through the turmoil with chilling clarity. Frag out! Just then I see a grenade, its pin pulled, arcs through the air. The world narrows to a heartbeat, a single moment stretched thin as it lands with a soft thud right next to where Tuyet and Luke are huddled. In that frozen moment her terrified eyes meet mine, a silent plea for help, for salvation, that I'm powerless to answer. The space between us, just a couple meters, stretches into an insurmountable distance. Without even thinking, I launch myself towards the grenade, every muscle tensed for the desperate attempt to save Tuyet and the boy Luke. But before my fingers can grasp its cold metal, Van surges past, shoving me out of the way. Get down, he bellows. In one fluid motion, he grabs the grenade, intent on hurling it back towards our attackers. But he's not fast enough. The grenade detonates in his hand. The explosion is deafening, a blast of heat and shrapnel that tears through the air. Van is thrown backward, his body a ragdoll caught in the blast's merciless embrace. The shockwave reverberates through my bones, my ears ringing, my vision blurred. When the dust settles, the air is filled with the smell of gunpowder and blood. My heart hammers in my chest as I crawl over to where Van lies prone on the floor. Van! I cry out. At first glance, Van seems miraculously intact, almost sleeping but the illusion shatters as I turn him over. His right forearm is gone, severed by the blast. Shrapnel wounds pepper his body. Half his face is missing, obliterated in an instant. His eyes flutter open, a glimmer of consciousness piercing through the haze of pain. His gaze falls on the bloody stump where his right arm once was. He attempts a weak, lopsided smile. At least, it wasn't my left arm. He rasps, his voice a barely audible whisper. He lifts his left hand, the one bearing his wedding ring. His breaths come shallow and ragged, each one a battle. I lean in closer, my hand finding his. Tuyet crawls over to my side. Together we attempt to administer first aid, but Van is too far gone. Tears blur my vision as I grip Van's remaining hand, my voice breaking. Why? Why would you do something so fucking stupid? He coughs, a faint chuckle escaping his lips despite the agony he must be in. Because you can't throw for shit, he manages to say. His fingers still warm squeeze mine. Tell, tell Han, he starts. But the words trail off unfinished as the light in his eyes dims. A final labored exhale escapes his lips, and then nothing. I gently remove Van's dog tags, the metal cool and heavy in my hand. My fingers find the wedding ring on his left hand slipping it off with a reverence that feels like a prayer. In his pockets I discover a worn letter, the edges frayed from being read and folded countless times. Beside it is a photo of Van, his wife Lan, and their little daughter Han, smiling, a moment of happiness frozen in time. The whiz of a bullet cutting through the air mere centimeters from my head jolts me back to the present. Scanning the room for any advantage, my gaze falls on a control panel mounted on the wall its interface glowing dimly. A biometric scanner sits beside it. I glance at the lifeless body of the scientist, an idea sparking amidst the despair. I drag his corpse closer, the blood from his wounds leaving a dark trail on the tiled floor. To yet, I call over the din of gunfire. I need his hand. Her eyes wide with horror before nodding grimly. Without a word, she pulls out her machete, its blade gleaming under the harsh fluorescent lights. With a swift motion, she hacks at the scientist's hand, the sound of bone and sinew giving way under the blade echoing sickeningly. Cover me, 
I shout, snatching up the severed hand and making a mad dash for the control panel. Bullets fly past, the air alive with the deadly song of gunfire. I can feel the heat of the shots as they slice through the space where I was just moments before. Halfway to the panel, a bullet tears through my shoulder, the impact knocking me off balance. I stagger, nearly dropping the gruesome key to our escape. The pain is immediate and searing, a hot iron pressed into my flesh. Do me no, motherfucker, I curse, pushing through it. Reaching the panel, I press the dead scientist's hand against the biometric scanner. The machine whirs, processing the grisly input. After a moment that stretches into eternity, the scanner beeps in affirmation, the light turning green. My eyes frantically search the control panel's interface. Among the myriad buttons and switches, one stands out, marked with a series of numbers that correspond to the mutant elephant's enclosure. Without hesitation, I press it. The heavy steel doors to the elephant's enclosure groan as they begin to slide open, the sound a harbinger of the chaos to come. The soldiers, momentarily distracted by this new development, shift their focus toward the source of the noise as they try to process the unfolding scene. From the darkness of the enclosure, the mutated elephant emerges. The tumors and growths that mar its skin seem to pulse with a malevolent energy, and its tentacle-like limb whips through the air with a mind of its own. As the creature steps into the light, a palpable sense of dread fills the room. The soldiers, trained to face human enemies, find themselves frozen in terror at the sight of this monstrosity. Their hesitation costs them dearly. With a trumpeting roar that shakes the very foundations of the laboratory, the creature charges. Its massive body moves with a terrifying speed. The soldiers open fire, but their bullets seem to do little more than enrage the beast further. The elephant's first victim is caught squarely by the charging monster, his body crushed beneath its immense weight with a sickening crunch. The creature's tentacle limb lashes out, wrapping around another soldier and tossing him aside like a toy. His screams are cut short as he collides with the wall, his body breaking upon impact. Its trunk, split and lined with teeth, snaps up a third man, lifting him into the air before biting down. The sound of breaking bones and tearing flesh is almost drowned out by the chaos of the room. Move! Move! I yell, firing a burst of covering fire. We make our break for the service tunnel, Elephant's Rampage providing the distraction we desperately need. Tuye grabs Luke, and we make a break for it, dodging between lab benches and equipment. Her movements are shadowed by Hung and Lam, who fire off a suppressing volley towards the soldiers trying to regroup. Then a soldier, torn in half but horrifically alive, is hurled into our path, his eyes wide with shock and agony. Without pausing, I sidestep the dying man. We dart into a narrow hallway, the sounds of its rampage a constant threat at our backs. As we spill into the service tunnel, the chaos of the lab behind us, Hung catches sight of my shoulder. Fuck, Than, you're hit, he exclaims, a note of panic in his voice. I glance down, almost surprised to see blood soaking through my shirt, the fabric clinging to my skin. The pain, masked by adrenaline until now, flares into sharp focus, a white-hot lance through my shoulder. I'm fine, I lie, gritting my teeth against the pain. To yet, catching the grimace of pain that I can't quite hide, orders, Sit. Now. Despite my instinct to keep moving, I find myself obeying, slumping against the cold wall. Hung rummages through his pack, producing a first aid kit. Its contents are spilled out in a practiced motion. Gauze, bandages, and small vials of morphine coming to rest on the concrete floor beside me. Lamb kneels beside me, his fingers probing the wound with a gentle precision. Bullets still in there, he mutters, more to himself than to me. Hung and Tuyet work in tandem, cleaning the wound. The sting of antiseptic bites into my flesh, drawing a hiss of pain through clenched teeth. Tuyette's hands are steady as she bandages the wound. As the adrenaline begins to ebb, the true extent of the pain crashes into me like a tidal wave. It's a searing, pulsating agony that radiates from my shoulder, each heartbeat a reminder of the injury. I can't help but let out a muffled curse, my grip on the cold floor of the tunnel tightening. Sorry, Tuyette murmurs, almost done here. I need morphine, I demand, the words barely a growl through gritted teeth. My tolerance for pain has its limits, and I'm rapidly approaching them. All right, but just a little bit, Lamb says, prepping the syringe. Don't need you passing out on us. 
With a quick jab, he administers the shot, the morphine entering my system. The relief is almost immediate, a warm wave that dulls the pain to a manageable throb. All right, can you stand? Tuyet asks. With a grunt, I push myself up, the tunnel swaying slightly around me. Yeah, let's get the fuck out of here, I say, my voice steadier than I feel. The cold hits us like a wall, the temperature plummeting as we delve deeper into the bowels of the cold storage facility. Our breaths fog in the frigid air, ghostly puffs that fade into the expanse ahead. The facility is a cavernous space, shelves stacked to the ceiling with ominous canisters, each one marked with warnings of biological hazards. As we move cautiously through the aisles, the sounds of frantic activity reach us. Soldiers and lab personnel scurry about, loading the canisters onto heavy-duty trucks parked at loading bays. The canisters are stenciled with the words, Agent Indigo. At the end of one aisle, a maintenance ladder is bolted to the wall, leading up to a narrow catwalk that runs the length of the storage area, crisscrossing overhead. We make a beeline for that ladder, moving as quietly as a group of heavily armed, slightly banged-up commandos possibly can. It's like some twisted game of hide-and-seek, with stakes much higher than any of us would like. Hung scales the ladder first. At the top he pauses, scanning the expanse of the cold storage facility from his elevated vantage point. He gestures for us to follow. Tuye hoists Luke up to Hung, who carefully lifts the boy onto the catwalk. One by one we follow. As we navigate the precarious catwalks above, the cold air bites at our exposed skin. The metal underfoot groans with every step. From this vantage point, we have a clear view of the facility's interior workings, a hive of activity. Below us, snippets of conversation that float up are tense, filled with urgency. Dr. Archer, the president, wants Grim Harvest and Agent Indigo buried, a voice asserts, the tone icy. No evidence, no loose ends. To hell with Nixon, another voice, who I assume Dr. Archer's growls. The only thing that matters now is securing Subject Lyra. Peering over the edge, I catch sight of a group of soldiers maneuvering a peculiar sight through the aisles below. What looks like a metal coffin, its surface sleek and unyielding, rigged with an array of complex machinery that hums with a life of its own. Through a small reinforced view window on top of the coffin, a deathly pale young woman is visible. She lies still. So still you'd think she was dead if not for the faint mist that clouds the glass with each shallow breath she takes. Her features are serene, almost angelic, but there's something unsettling about the way she's encased, like a specimen preserved for study rather than rest. As the soldiers fumble with the coffin, their movements clumsy in their haste, Dr. Archer's voice cuts through the chaos, like a knife slicing through the buzz of activity. Careful with her. She's more valuable than all of you put together. I stick my head out a bit more, my grip on the cold metal of the catwalk tightening as my eyes find the source of the commanding voice. It's an older man, his attire more civilian than military. A chill down my spine as I see the deep, jagged scars etched into his face, stretching his mouth into a permanent smile. This Dr. Archer is the smiling man Luke mentioned. The smiling man approaches the metallic coffin. He places a hand gently on the glass, leaning in close as if sharing a secret with the still form inside. Don't worry, Lyra, he murmurs, his voice barely audible above the din. We'll bring you back. We're so close now. We don't waste any more time gawking as we move on. Suddenly a sharp, piercing alarm cuts through the facility, a harsh wail that echoes off the metal and concrete. Over the loudspeaker, a voice, cool and detached, announces, Attention all personnel! Intruders have been detected within the premises. They are to be considered armed and dangerous. Initiate lockdown protocol immediately. It's like watching ants when you poke their hill. Soldiers and lab workers alike snap to attention, their movements becoming more frenetic. Doors slam shut heavy metallic thuds that echo ominously through the vast space while soldiers scramble to barricade exits, their rifles at the ready. Our escape route, a mere whisper of hope moments ago, seems to be slipping away with each clanging echo of steel on steel. Shit! I hiss under my breath the word a cloud of vapor in the cold. We're boxed in, the catwalk offering a bird's-eye view of a trap snapping shut, but then, eyes darting around in desperation, I spot it our slim chance. Far across the opposite end, a maintenance door. 
It's barely visible, tucked away like a secret, but it's a shot. But getting there would be like crossing no man's land in broad daylight. We need a distraction, something big, chaotic enough to turn every head away from that door. My gaze snags on a monstrosity of machinery, pipes, and tanks, all connected in a way that screams, important. And nestled among them, a large rack filled with canisters of Agent Indigo. I catch Hung's eye, gesturing subtly to the machinery with a tilt of my head. He nods, understanding flashing in his gaze. With a swift, silent command, I signal Tuyet and Lam to keep low and move Luke to a safer position. Hung, meanwhile, carefully shoulders his RPG. The weapon seems almost comically large in the cramped space of the catwalk. He waits for my signal, his eyes locked on mine, a silent question hanging between us. Are we really doing this? I give a curt nod, the decision made. There's no going back now. Hung aims the RPG at the heart of the Agent Indigo storage system. The room below us is a beehive of activity, oblivious to the storm about to break over them. The RPG's roar is deafening, a sound that ricochets off the walls with physical force. Time seems to slow as the rocket arcs through the air like a deadly comet. The impact is like the hand of God coming down. The explosion is a hellish bloom of fire and shrapnel, tearing through the machinery and igniting the agent indigo. The resulting inferno is a thing of terrible beauty, a whirlwind of blue flames that dance with a life of their own. The explosion sets off a chain reaction that rips through the facility like a wrathful storm. The base's personnel, caught in the middle of their frantic preparations, don't stand a chance. The blue flames spread with a hungry intensity, engulfing everything in their path. It's like watching hell expand, the fire consuming flesh and metal alike without distinction or mercy. With the facility descending into pandemonium, the screams of the trapped and burning are a haunting chorus that I know will haunt my dreams. But worse than the screams are the groans, low, guttural sounds that begin to rise above the crackle of flames. The dead, or whatever's left of them in this twisted place, are waking up. As the undead draw closer, we make a desperate dash up a set of stairs leading to the maintenance door, our only chance of escape. Reaching the door, I see it's locked, the biometric pad blinking mockingly in the dim light. I retrieve the severed hand from my pack, pressing the grotesque key against the pad, yielding nothing but a blinking red light in refusal. Fuck, I curse. I think the hand's too cold. The scanner can't read it, Tuyet observes, her voice strained. In a frenzied attempt to warm the severed hand, I rub my hands over its cold, lifeless flesh. My breath clouds in the frigid air as I blow warm air onto the hand, desperately hoping to trick the scanner into recognizing it. But it's not enough. The scanner remains unresponsive. Lamb, thinking quickly, grabs the hand. Let me try something. He tucks it under his arm, trying to transfer his body heat to the lifeless flesh. Need some help here, Hung shouts, his rifle's muzzle flashing as he fires into the advancing horror. I whirl around just in time to see two smoldering undead soldiers, their uniforms charred and their flesh seething with blue flames, charging up the stairs towards us. I raise my rifle, taking aim at the closest one. The bullets tear through the approaching undead, stopping it in its tracks. Before I can fully register the threat, the second undead soldier closes the gap, its burned body pressed against me, its jaw snapping at my face. The stench of charred flesh and death is overwhelming, nearly choking me. In a panic-driven reflex, I fumble for the Makarov at my side, yanking it free from its holster. With the creature's grotesque face looming over mine, I jam the muzzle of the pistol under its jaw and squeeze the trigger. The shot reverberates sharply in the confined space. The creature's head snaps back, its body going limp before collapsing in a heap at my feet. But there's no time to catch my breath. The sounds of more approaching undead grow louder. Hurry up, I shout back. Here goes nothing, Lam says, pressing the hand against the scanner again. This time, after a tense moment, the light blinks green, and with a heavy metallic click, the door unlocks. Tuyet and Luke rush through first. Lam and Hung follow. As I stand at the threshold, my gaze catches the sight of at least half a dozen undead shambling up the bottom of the staircase. I pull a grenade from my belt, the pin between my fingers. With a last glance at the horror we're fleeing, I toss it down the staircase, the small cylinder of death tumbling end over end towards the advancing undead. I don't wait to see the explosion. 
The moment the grenade leaves my hand, I turn and slam the door shut. The thud of the door is followed by the muffled boom of the grenade, the shock wave reverberating through the door and into my bones. I take a deep breath, allowing myself a moment to steady my racing heart. Then, with a nod to my team, we move on. We follow a corridor lit only by emergency lights that leads us to the loading bay, a large open space filled with crates and vehicles. The far end of the bay opens up to a pair of heavy metal doors, standing ajar, revealing the dark outline of a courtyard beyond. It's the exit that promises freedom from this nightmarish ordeal. But our relief is short-lived. As we draw nearer, the unmistakable sound of helicopter rotors stops us in our tracks. We press ourselves against the cold walls. I motion to keep low. Peering around the corner, the sight that greets us tightens the knot of dread in my stomach. The smiling man, flanked by a squad of heavily armed soldiers, stands at the threshold of our only way out. They are preparing the coffin-like container for transport. His voice cuts through the air, sharp and commanding. We need to get Lyra to the Chinook now. This place is lost. One of the soldiers, burdened with heavy equipment, turns to him. Sir, there's not going to be room for you, he says, his voice laced with an urgency that borders on panic. Archer's reaction is chilling in its indifference. I don't care, he snaps, his gaze never leaving the coffin. As long as she makes it, nothing else matters. As the group wheels the coffin towards the awaiting Chinook in the courtyard, the sound of its rotors beating against the air grows louder. The soldiers begin to close the heavy steel doors behind them, threatening to seal us inside with the nightmare we've unleashed. Realizing time is slipping through our fingers like sand, I signal to my team. Without hesitation, we break cover, rushing towards the doors with the desperation of the damned. Our footsteps echo loudly, a drumbeat to our frantic sprint. The soldiers, caught by surprise, react with trained efficiency, turning their weapons towards us. Bullets whiz past, close enough to singe the air. Tuyet, still protecting Luke, falls behind me, her movements hampered by the need to shield him. Lam and Hung flank her, providing cover fire. As we close the distance, the doors begin to inch shut, the finality of it like a death knell. I surge forward, throwing caution to the wind, firing my AK-47 in controlled bursts. A bullet grazes my thigh, a line of fire that almost buckles my knees. I grit my teeth against the pain, pushing through it. But it's too late. With a resounding clang, the doors slam shut. Kicking at the doors proves futile. The heavy steel doesn't even budge under the assault of our boots and shoulders. The sounds of the undead grow closer, a cacophony of groans and dragging feet encroaching from three directions. I reach into my pack, my fingers finding the cold, malleable block of Semtex. Lamb joins me as we work to set the charges, a race against the relentless advance of the undead. The corridors echo with their hungry moans, a chilling soundtrack to our desperate efforts. Lamb presses the plastic explosive along the door's seams. I wire the charges, connecting them to a detonator. Our audience, the undead, draws ever closer, their disjointed limbs casting long, grotesque shadows that stretch towards us. Tuyet and Hung stand ready, their weapons aimed at the encroaching horde. Luke clings to Tuyet, his small body pressed against hers. Ready, I say, connecting the last wire. Finding cover behind a nearby pillar, we brace for the explosion. With a deep breath, I press the detonator. The blast is a thunderclap, the sound rolling over us. Dust and debris fill the air, a blinding, choking cloud. As it clears, we see the doors, now twisted pieces of metal blown clear off their hinges. We surge through the gaping maw into the open, the night air cool against our sweat-drenched faces. The eviscerated bodies of soldiers caught in the blast are strewn about, among the carnage, a gravely injured soldier, barely more than a boy, reaches tremblingly for his dropped weapon. Our eyes meet, a momentary connection. I raise my rifle and fire, the shot swift and merciful. The soldier slumps, his struggle ending in a silent exhale. The courtyard, bathed in the harsh light of the Chinook spotlights, feels like a stage set for our final act. The Chinook, its twin rotors whipping the air into a frenzy, begins to lift off, carrying its precious cargo away from the madness below. I bark a command to Hung, take it down. Hung quickly loads a fresh rocket into the launcher, but just as he aligns his sight with the fleeing helicopter, a weak voice pierces the din. Please don't, I beg you. 
It's Dr. Archer, the smiling man emerging from beneath a pile of rubble, his body a map of wounds and his face smeared with blood. I ignore Archer's pleas, turning my gaze back to Hung. Do it, I say, my voice steady. But then he speaks again, his voice cracking with emotion. My daughter, she's on board, please don't do this. The revelation stirs a turmoil within me, a storm of conflicting emotions. Hold your fire, I shout, my voice cutting through the chaos. Hung wavers, the launcher still aimed skyward, a look of confusion on his face. I approach Archer, the barrel of my rifle pressing coldly against his forehead. His eyes, bloodshot and desperate, lock onto mine. My daughter Lyra was a frontline nurse. She was killed at Kaysan, he gasps, his voice a shattered whisper. This... Agent Indigo, was my attempt to bring her back. You used it on innocent civilians, I snap back, the weight of what we've witnessed, the horrors unleashed by his obsession fueling my anger. Archer's gaze falters, his voice a murmur of broken justifications. I had to weaponize it. It was the only way they would fund my research. It was for her, all for her. The conflict rages within me, a storm of empathy and revulsion, Hung's voice slices through the tension, urgent and clear. Now or never, Thon. Archer, his voice breaking with desperation, pleads, Please do what you want with me, but let Lyra go. She's innocent in all of this. The conflict within me rages, Archer's plea echoing in my ears. I look to Hung, seeing the readiness in his eyes, the launcher still aimed at the sky where the Chinook hovers, a shrinking silhouette against the night. I take a deep breath, feeling the weight of the moment settle upon my shoulders. Every fiber of my being screams for justice, for retribution for the horrors we've witnessed, for the lives lost and irrevocably altered by Archer's madness. But then I think of Lyra, another victim out of countless victims of this senseless war. Stand down, Hung, I order, my voice steady but laden with an unseen weight. Hung hesitates, his gaze flicking between me and the Chinook, then slowly lowers the RPG. Archer slumps, relief and resignation mingling in his expression. Thank you. The villagers' initial wariness of us, the armed strangers, fades as they welcome you as heroes. After washing away the grime and the vestiges of death that clung to our skin, the villagers invite us to join them for a communal meal. It's a somber affair. There's an undercurrent of grief for those lost and a quiet gratitude for the lives spared. During the meal, Tuyet's hand finds mine beneath the rough-hewn table. Her fingers interlace with mine, squeezing tight. It's a cathartic gesture that binds us closer than any words could. We quietly excuse ourselves from the communal table, slipping away into the cool evening. I leave first, followed by Tuyet, as to not draw any unwanted attention. Tuye leads me to a small secluded hut on the edge of the village. The air between us is thick with unspoken emotions. As we step inside the dimly lit interior, the door closing behind us with a soft click, the silence becomes almost palpable. We sit there, less than a meter apart, neither of us finding the words to breach the distance between us. My heart races, pounding against my ribs with the same ferocity it did when we were surrounded by the undead. Except now there's no gunfire, no screams, just the quiet night that envelops the both of us. I start whistling a tune to help ease my nerves. Tuyet breaks the silence, a slight smile curving her lips. That's the same tune you were whistling when we were in the tunnels. I chuckle, a bit embarrassed. Yeah, sorry, it's a nervous tick, I guess. Keeps my mind focused. It sounds nice, she says, her gaze holding mine. What's the song called? Flowers in your hair, I reply. I heard it at a dance I attended a while back. Never knew the band, but the song stuck with me. Tuyet's laughter, light and unexpected, fills the space between us, cutting through the tension. You dance? She teases, her eyes sparkling with curiosity. I never took you for a dancer. I can't help but smile, feeling a warmth that has little to do with the humid air of the hut. A little, I admit. I'm no Lin Gok Kan, but I've been known to hold my own on the dance floor. Tuyet nervously twists one of her braided pigtails around her finger, an action that betrays her uncertainty. Could you maybe show me a few steps? The request takes me by surprise, but the earnestness in her eyes makes it impossible to refuse. Sure, I say, my voice steadier than I feel. 
It's easy, really. Standing up, I extend my hand towards her, an invitation. May I have this dance? Tuyette smiles, gingerly placing her hand in mine, her touch light as a feather. I guide her into my arms, conscious of the space between us, of her warmth and the faint scent of jasmine that seems to cling to her skin. With a gentle pressure on her back, I lead her into the first step, the movement tentative at first. Just follow my lead, I murmur, our steps slowly finding a rhythm of their own. There's no music, just the sound of our footsteps on the wooden floor and the distant hum of the village at night. As we move together in the dim oil lamplight of the hut, the world outside fades away. For a moment it's just the two of us, lost in a dance of our own making. My gaze drops to meet hers, and I find myself truly seeing her for the first time since we met. I'm struck by her beauty. The faint glow of the lantern illuminates her features, casting a soft light that plays across her face, highlighting her fair complexion, her freckled cheek, and the gentle curve of her lips. Her dark eyes, framed by long, thick lashes, hold mine with an intensity that sends a shiver down my spine. I can feel the warmth of her breath against my skin, her heart beating in sync with mine. As we sway to the rhythm of our own hearts, I find myself leaning in. Her eyes widen in surprise, but she doesn't pull away. Instead, she meets me halfway, her lips pressing gently against mine. Without a word, we begin to strip away the layers of clothing that separate us, eager to feel skin against skin. It's a slow, almost reverent process, each movement deliberate as we take in every centimeter of each other's exposed bodies. We stumble back towards the small cot in the corner, our bodies entwined as we lose ourselves in each other. Neither of us really knows what we're doing. We just do what feels right. We move as if guided by some primal instinct, our actions born out of a mutual desire to feel something, anything, beyond the fear and pain that have consumed us for so long. As the first rays of dawn seep through the curtains, casting a soft glow within the hut, I stir gently. Too yet, peacefully asleep in my arms, breathes softly. I take a moment to watch her sleep, memorizing the details, knowing that it may be the last time I see them. Carefully, I extricate myself from her embrace, ensuring not to disturb her rest. She murmurs something in her sleep, a soft smile on her lips. I cover her with a thin blanket, tucking it around her shoulders. I silently dress and step outside. Rejoining Lamb and Hung in their hut, they give me a somber smile. They're already up, quietly packing their own gear, each movement heavy with the unspoken weight of what's to come. We work in silence, the kind that's loud with all the things better left unsaid. Once I'm done packing, I do a final check, ensuring everything is secured. I pull out the black and white family photo I've kept tucked away. While looking at it, an idea strikes me, a gesture that feels like necessary for a proper goodbye. Carefully, I tear myself out of the photo, the rip sound echoing louder in the morning stillness than I expected. As I'm folding the larger piece of photo to tuck into my pocket, I hear a stirring at the doorway. Turning, I see yet, breathless as if she's been sprinting. Relief floods her features when she sees me. Da, I was afraid I'd just missed you, she says. I step toward her, the torn photo of myself in my hand. I wouldn't leave without saying goodbye, I tell her. As I extend the torn photo towards Tuyet, she hesitates for a moment before reaching into her pocket. She pulls out a similarly torn photo, this one of herself, seemingly torn from a larger picture as well. Our fingers touch briefly as we exchange our photos. It's a bittersweet moment filled with the unspoken promises and regrets of what might have been. As I glance back at Lamb and Hung, Give us a moment, I ask, my voice softer than usual. They nod in understanding. Hung with a playful grin says, Try to send him back to us in one piece. Yeah, we've grown quite fond of him, Lamb jokes, despite how damn ugly he is. Tuye chuckles, a spark of light in her eyes. I'll do my best, but I'm not making any promises. Take care, you two. Never change who you are, she says, giving each of them a hug. You too, sister, Hung replies. Lamb places a hand on my shoulder, squeezing it lightly. Take as much time as you need. Thanks, brother, I say. As Tuyet and I stand there, holding each other in the quiet dawn, she untangles her checkered black and white scarf from around her neck and drapes it over mine. The fabric feels soft against my skin, carrying the warmth of her body. 
She smiles up at me. If anyone asks, she starts, tying the scarf into a knot. Her smile widens playfully. You can tell them you took it off an elusive Viet Cong sniper you killed with your bare hands. I laugh, the sound more heartbroken than I intended. Feeling the need to reciprocate, my hand instinctively goes to the unit badge sewn onto my uniform. With careful movements, I use my knife to cut the threads that bind the badge to the fabric, making sure not to tear the material. Once the badge is free, I hold it out to two yet. And you can tell everyone you shot an elite ranger at 1,000 meters. Tuyet stares at the badge in her hands, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. I step closer, wrapping my arms around her in a tight embrace. I'll find you, I whisper into her ear, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. When this godforsaken war is over, I'll come back for you. She pulls back slightly, looking up at me as if to gauge my sincerity. With a shaky breath, she manages a smile. Don't keep me waiting too long, she says, her voice strong despite the tears that finally spill over. I lean in, pressing my lips to hers in a kiss that feels like both a beginning and an end. Time seems to stand still at that moment. The intensity of our emotions makes it feel like an eternity. Yet when we finally part, it feels as though no time has passed at all, leaving us yearning for more. The sound of distant artillery a grim reminder of the reality we're forced to return to, breaks the spell. With one last look at Tuyet, I turn to join Lam and Hung, each step away from her heavier than the last. Leaving Tuyet and the village behind, we navigate the dense jungle, heading south towards our headquarters. The terrain is unforgiving, a tangled maze of vegetation that seems intent on impeding our progress. Several hours into our journey, the dense jungle gives way to a narrow clearing, the sound of running water reaches our ears, a signal that we're close to one of the many rivers that crisscross this region. Cautiously, we approach the riverbank. As we scout the area for enemy activity, the distant hum of a boat engine catches our attention. With weapons raised and hearts racing, we prepare for whatever comes around the river bend. Hiding among the foliage, we watch as a patrol boat rounds a bend in the river, its camouflage paint blending with the surroundings. To our relief and surprise, we see the hull painted with the familiar colors and insignia of the South Vietnamese Navy. As the boat slows, approaching cautiously, we signal to the crew, identifying ourselves as friendly. The sailors aboard the patrol boat are initially wary. After a brief but tense exchange of identification and purpose, their wariness turns to welcome. We're pulled aboard the vessel with efficient, helping hands. Sitting across from my dad, the dim light of the living room casting long shadows on his face, I could see the toll recounting that story had taken on him. It was a lot to take in, the kind of tale you'd expect to find in books or movies, not in the life of someone you knew, someone as close as your own father. He leaned back into the sofa, his eyes closing for a moment. The silence between us was heavy. Wow, was all I managed to utter. I always intended to go back for two yet, he began his voice tinged with a sadness that seemed to permeate the room. But life, life has a way of taking plans and twisting them into something unrecognizable. The U.S. withdrew from Vietnam, and not long after, the South fell to the North. Everything changed overnight. I found myself a refugee, displaced, with nothing but what I could carry and the memories of what had been. He sighed, a sound that seemed to carry the weight of years and continents. After I came to America, everything was about building a new life from the ashes of the old one. I met your mom, and we started a family. Life. It just moved on, you know. My dad tried to stand up from the sofa, but the chemotherapy had taken its toll on his strength. As he wobbled, I rushed over, catching him just before he could fall. Dad, you've got to be more careful, I said, helping him sit back down. Could you do me a favor? There's something in the closet I want to show you he asked. Curious, I made my way to the closet he mentioned. Pushing aside coats and boxes, I found a heavy wooden box hidden at the back. Carefully, I pulled the box out and carried it back to my dad. His eyes lit up as he saw it. After the liberation, I had to burn most of my personal effects from the war, he began, his fingers tracing the contours of the box. But I managed to save a few things. 
I watched as my dad flipped the latch and opened the lid of the box with a reverence that seemed almost sacred. The first items he carefully lifted out were his medals and ribbons. They were worn, the colors faded, but the pride they represented remained undiminished. Beneath the medals, a stack of photos caught my attention. I carefully lifted them, feeling the weight of history in my hands. The first photo was of my paternal grandparents, along with aunts and uncles. There was a big chunk missing from the side of the photo where my dad would be. Next, I saw a photo of his platoon, young men in uniform, standing tall and proud. My dad pointed to himself, a much younger version, and then to others he had mentioned in his story. There was also a more recent photo, taken a few years ago. My dad was sitting with two men, their faces familiar from my childhood, Uncle Lam and Uncle Hung. I smiled at the memory of them visiting our home, their families blending with ours during those visits. They were like extended family, their children like cousins to me. We never spoke of what happened, not even among ourselves, he confessed. We were afraid. If the CIA ever found out what we saw, what we did, well, let's just say we weren't sure they'd leave us in peace. They've both passed, you know. Cancer took them, he paused. Lung cancer for lamb and hung pancreatic cancer. My attention was drawn back to the box as I noticed a scarf, its fabric tinged with specks of dark, half a century old blood. I gently lifted the scarf, holding it up to the dim light. The checkered pattern seemed to dance as the light filtered through its weave. It felt surreal, holding a tangible piece of my dad's story in my hands. Beneath the scarf, my attention was captured by a torn photograph. It was a picture of a young woman, dressed in a traditional Ao Dai, her poise and grace undeniable even in the simple black-and-white photograph, her smile radiating warmth and a sense of familiarity. Is this too yet? I asked. Yeah, it is, he said. After all these years, I still think about her, about what life she led after the war, if she found happiness. Did you, I started, did you ever try to find out what happened to her? He sighed, a deep, weary sound. I did try, but Vietnam was closed off to the world for years, and by the time it opened up again, I knew it was too late. There was no longer a path back to her. I had to let go, for the sake of my family here for your mom and for you kids. I could feel the heartbreak in his voice, but I didn't know what I could possibly say to make it better. You know, I've been thinking a lot about my life, especially now, he said. My time is running out. I've made peace with that. He paused. I've lived a good life. I did some crazy shit in my youth. Then I came here and raised a beautiful family. What more can a guy ask for? He continued, his eyes meeting mine. But there's always been this void, an unresolved chapter of my past. I knew what he wanted to say before he said it. If Tuyet is still out there, if she's alive, I'd like to see her one last time. And if she's not, then I'd at least like to lay flowers at her grave. I owe her that. His gaze held mine, imploring me to understand the depth of his request. Dad, of course, I replied. We'll find her together, I promise. His hand reached out, gripping mine with a strength that surprised me. Thank you, he whispered, a profound relief washing over his face. The very next day, Dad's condition took a sudden and unexpected turn for the worse. It happened so quickly. One moment he was sharing with me any details that could help find two yet, and the next he was struggling to breathe. The cancer, which had seemed to be at bay, roared back with a vengeance, leaving us scrambling. The end came in the early hours of the morning with only the sterile hum of hospital machines for company. I held his hand, feeling the warmth slowly ebb away, until he was gone, leaving a silence in his wake that was heavier than I ever could have imagined. The funeral brought my sisters and their families back from out of state. We gathered, a small somber group under the cloudy sky, as we prepared to lay Dad to rest next to Mom, Lone, who had passed away years before. Losing Dad was like losing a piece of myself, the house felt emptier, the silence more profound. Yet amidst the grief, a fire had been lit within me, a determination to fulfill his final wish. I would find too yet. The task seemed insurmountable. Vietnam had changed so much, and all I had was a first name and a half-century-old photograph. But I couldn't let it go. I considered my options. The only person I could think of who could help was Ash, 
an old buddy of mine who, alongside his wife Raina, ran a private eye firm out of New Orleans. They were somewhat of legends in their field, having solved a 25-year-old missing person's cold case with little more than a faded Polaroid and a heap of intuition. It was a long shot, but if anyone could track down Touillette after all these years, it would be them. I dialed Ash's number, the familiar tones echoing in the empty room, each one heavy with the weight of hope and desperation. The call connected and Ash's voice, deep and slightly gruff, greeted me. Hey buddy, it's been a while, what's up? He asked, the warmth in his voice a small comfort. Catching up with Ash brought a brief respite from the gloom that had settled over me. He shared the news of Raina giving birth to twins, a boy and a girl, the joy evident even through the phone line. It's a whole new adventure for us, he said, his voice tinged with the unmistakable pride of a new father. Congrats on the twins, man, that's amazing news, I said, genuinely happy for him. Thanks, it's been a wild ride, how about you? How's everything on your end, Ash inquired. Well, Mira's expecting too, I revealed, the news still feeling surreal every time I said it out loud. We're excited and scared all at once. That's fantastic, man, he said, sounding ecstatic for me. Yeah, it is, I managed to say. There's something else, isn't there? I can hear it in your voice. What's going on? Ash asked. His perceptiveness was impeccable. I took a deep breath before I spoke. Actually, I called to ask you for a favor, Ash. It's... I need you to find someone. It's important, I began, my voice faltering as I tried to find the words to explain the magnitude of the task. Ash paused, the silence on the line stretching between us. You know... Raina and I have actually stepped back from the detective life since the twins were born. Family first, you know, he said with a hint of regret. I nodded, even though he couldn't see me. I completely understand. I normally wouldn't ask, but it's just, it's about my old man. He, he passed away recently, I admitted, the words heavy on my tongue. Shit, dude, I'm sorry to hear that, Ash's voice softened. Your dad was a great man. All right, tell me what you need. I explained everything to him then, the story my dad had entrusted to me, his final wish to find two yet, and the very little I had to go on. I could hear Ash listening intently the occasional uh-huh signaling his engagement. When I finished there was a brief pause. That's quite a story, Ash finally said. I can see why this means so much to you. Yeah, it's, it's the least I can do for him, I said feeling the weight of that truth settle around me. Ash sighed deeply. Look, I'll have to run it by Raina first. But for old time's sake, and because it's for your dad, I'll see what I can do. I can't promise anything, though. Relief washed over me, mingled with gratitude. Thanks, bro, really, thank you. I know it's a long shot, but even just trying means a lot to me. We'll need all the details you can give us. Every little bit helps, he says. Yeah, okay, sure. I reply, feeling a surge of hope. And hey, let's catch up properly when you're not neck deep in grief, okay? Ash's attempt to lighten the mood was welcome. Yeah, that sounds good. I managed a small smile, the first in what felt like ages. And Ash, thanks again. This means the world to me. No problem, buddy. We'll get started right away. And congratulations on the baby, by the way. That's something to hold on to. Something new to look forward to, Ash reminded me bringing a flicker of warmth to the cold space left by my father's passing. Over the next few days, Ash kept me updated with regular calls and texts. Each time the phone buzzed, my heart skipped, hoping for the news I so desperately needed to hear. But as the days passed, those calls were filled with more of Ash and Raina's tireless efforts and dead ends than the breakthrough I was waiting for. Then nearly two weeks in, my phone rang with Ash's number. I picked up on the first ring, barely able to contain my anticipation. We found her, Ash's voice came through, cutting straight to the chase. You did? I asked, not believing my own ears. Yeah, we did, he confirmed, a tired but triumphant smile spreading across his face as he switched to FaceTime. Ash looked exactly as I remembered him, albeit with a few more grays and the unmistakable signs of sleepless nights etched under his eyes. Rainy appeared in the background, her voice floating in. I'll join you all in a sec. Ash started, detailing their steps with a level of detail that was frankly astonishing. So, first we combed through military archives for any mention of a Tuyet fitting your description around the specified time frame, he said, 
his tone shifting to what I could only describe as detective mode. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack, considering how common the name is. Raina finally joined Ash in front of the camera. Her hair was pulled back in a practical ponytail, and she wore a simple t-shirt that had seen better days, likely a casualty of motherhood. Her face, though tired, was alight with the excitement of their success. Hey, sorry about that. Bedtime is like negotiating with tiny, unreasonable bosses, she said. Her slight accent danced softly on the edges of her words. We hit a gold mine when we stumbled upon a local newspaper article from 2018. It was a profile on a veteran named Din Maituyat, Ash said, his tone animated, reflecting the importance of this find. She was described as a sniper during the war. The timeline matched perfectly with what you told us. Raina leaned closer to the screen, her eyes bright. The article mentioned that she's retired and living in Hoi An. It even had a photo of her, and let me tell you, the resemblance to the woman in your dad's photo is uncanny, she added, her excitement palpable. I was speechless, a whirlwind of emotions swirling within me. That's... that's incredible. I can't believe you found her, I managed to say. Raina nodded, a gentle seriousness overtaking her features. We've made preliminary contact just to confirm it's her. She's a bit wary, understandably, but she's open to meeting you. She mentioned something about unfinished stories that needed closure. There's something else you should know, Ash says, his tone suddenly serious. He glances at Raina. Cherie, you might want to sit down for this part, Raina suggested. Confused and a bit apprehensive, I take a seat, my heart pounding in anticipation of what could possibly add more weight to this already heavy revelation. What is it? I ask, bracing myself. Ash paused as if gathering his thoughts or perhaps considering the weight of his next words. We found birth records. Tuyet had a son, Nan, born roughly within a year of her meeting your dad. The information hung in the air between us, a bombshell that seemed to warp the very fabric of reality around me. Are you saying? I asked. Ash nodded, his expression empathetic yet unwavering. Yes, we believe your dad is Nan's father. You have a half-brother. After the call, I was in a daze, my mind racing with the magnitude of what I'd just learned. A half-brother. A part of my dad's life, his story, that I never knew existed. The rest of the day passed in a blur, my thoughts a tangled mess of emotions I couldn't quite sort through. The sound of the front door opening snapped me back to the present. Spencer, I'm home, my wife Mira called out. Her footsteps echoed in the hallway her presence a comforting constant in the whirlwind my life had become in the past few hours. How did the doctor's appointment go, I asked, trying to focus on the present. Mira smiled, her hand instinctively resting on her belly. It went well, she said. The doctor says everything's looking good, baby's healthy and growing right on schedule. Mira and I had been trying to conceive for years, facing setback after setback, each negative test, each failed attempt had been a small heartbreak, but we kept trying, holding on to hope, supporting each other through every disappointment. That's great news, I replied, my voice genuine but distracted. Mira noticed, her gaze sharpening as she studied my face. Everything okay? You seem off, she said, concern lacing her words. I hesitated, unsure of how to even begin explaining the day's revelations. It's complicated. I found out something about my dad today. It's a lot to process. Mira came over, her concern for me evident in every step. Want to talk about it? She asked, her voice soft. I nodded, the floodgates opening as I shared everything Ash and Raina had uncovered. Mira listened, her presence a steady anchor as I navigated the stormy seas of my emotions. By the end, the room was filled with a heavy silence, both of us contemplating the weight of what I'd just shared. Mira reached out, her hand finding mine, her touch a reminder of the strength we shared. I think I need to go to Vietnam, I finally said, the words feeling both freeing and terrifying as they left my lips. I need to meet Tuyet and Nan. Mira's response wasn't immediate, but when it came, it was delivered with the same strength and understanding she'd shown me through every challenge we'd faced together. Then you should go, she said, her voice firm yet gentle. But what about... Mira cut me off gently. We'll be fine here, she assured me, her hand resting on her belly. This is something you need to do, not just for your dad, but for yourself. 
and I'll be here waiting for you to come back and tell us both the story. In the weeks that followed, I made preparations for the trip. The logistics were complex, the emotional preparation even more so. Mira was my constant, her presence a calming force in the whirlwind of passport renewals, flight bookings, and late-night worries that plagued me. The day of my departure arrived all too quickly. Standing at the terminal of LAX with Mira beside me, I felt the magnitude of the journey I was about to undertake. Promise me you'll be careful, Mira said, her voice thick with emotion. I promise, I replied, wrapping her in a tight hug, feeling the solid reality of her, of us. With one last kiss, I turned and walked towards the security checkpoint, not daring to look back, for fear that the sight of her standing there would unravel the delicate courage I'd managed to weave together. The flight from Los Angeles to Saigon was a grueling one. I found myself cramped in economy, sandwiched between a chatty tourist with a penchant for dad jokes and a quiet Vietnamese woman who spent most of the flight with her eyes closed, possibly in prayer or just seeking peace amidst the chaos of travel. As the hours stretched on, I tried to distract myself with movies I barely followed and music that sounded more like noise against the drone of the aircraft. Sleep proved elusive my mind racing with thoughts of what lay ahead. Upon landing at Tan San Nat International Airport, the wave of tropical heat hit me the moment I stepped off the plane. The customs process was chaotic. I was pulled aside for a random check, the customs official's eyes glinting with the unspoken expectation of a bribe. Reluctantly, I slipped a few crisp bills into my passport as I handed it over for inspection. The official's demeanor shifted subtly, a nod of understanding passing between us before he waved me through with a barely perceptible smile. The connecting flight to Da Nang was shorter, the plane cutting through deep blue sky of dusk. As soon as I disembarked from the plane at Da Nang, I navigated through the modest but bustling airport to find a somewhat quieter corner. Taking out my phone, I dialed the number of the contact Ash and Raina had given me. It belonged to Du Yen, Tuyet's granddaughter and Nan's daughter. The phone rang twice before a voice answered, clear and confident. Hello? Hi, Duyan. It's Spencer, I said, my voice betraying none of the turmoil inside. I just arrived. Ah, I've been expecting your call, Duyan replied, her English nearly flawless and tinged with a warm tone. You'll recognize me when you see me. I'm just outside the arrival gate holding a sign with your name on it. Thanking her, I ended the call and made my way to the baggage claim to collect my suitcase. Once I had my belongings, I headed for the exit, scanning the crowd for a sign with my name. True to her word, it didn't take long to spot Duyan. She was younger than I expected, probably in her early twenties, with a bright, welcoming smile. Her sign, a simple piece of cardboard with Spencer written in bold letters, stood out among the throngs of people. Duyan's appearance was strikingly reminiscent of the young woman in the photograph my father had cherished. She had the same gentle eyes and the same confident stance. Spencer Hewing? she called out as I approached, her smile widening in recognition. Yes, that's me, I confirmed, extending my hand for a shake that she quickly bypassed in favor of a warm hug. It's good to meet you. Welcome to Vietnam, she said, stepping back to look at me again, as if trying to find traces of her father in my face. Let's get you settled. We have a bit of a drive ahead of us to Hoi An. Duyan led me through the parking lot. As we walked, she glanced over at me. So, what should I call you? Mr. Hewing? Uncle? Her tone was playful yet respectful, acknowledging our familial connection yet uncertain of its boundaries. Just call me Spencer, I replied, smiling. All right, Spencer it is, she said with a nod. As we stepped outside, the humidity enveloping me like a thick blanket, Du Yen led me to our ride. My expectation of a car vanished when I saw a Honda Wave parked by the curb. My eyes widened in disbelief. We're taking that? I asked, gesturing to the small motorcycle, then to my suitcase. Du Yen giggled, sensing my apprehension. Don't worry, we make it work here. With a deftness born of practice, she arranged my luggage and secured it, then handed me a helmet. You'll need this. The police are strict about helmet laws. I put on the helmet and climbed onto the back of the wave, my hands tentatively finding a hold as Duyan kick-started the engine to life. The ride was an experience unlike any I'd ever had. 
Duyan navigated through the chaotic traffic with the skill of a seasoned rider, weaving between cars and trucks with what seemed like mere inches to spare. Every honk and near miss had me holding on to her tighter than I intended. But Duyan seemed unfazed, occasionally throwing curses at particularly errant drivers. Trying to distract myself from the fear of imminent death, I struck up a conversation with Duyen, raising my voice to be heard over the roar of the engine and the cacophony of the traffic. So, how's life in Hoi An? I asked, raising my voice slightly to be heard over the noise of the traffic. It's peaceful, mostly, touristy, but it has its charm, she replied, her voice steady despite the constant maneuvering. You'll see, it's a world away from this. How's Tuyet and Nan? I asked. Grandma's strong, but she's getting old, you know. She talks about the past a lot. I think she's looking forward to meeting you. She paused, navigating a tight turn before adding, Dad's complicated. He's had a tough few years. Her words did little to calm the storm of emotions brewing inside me. The anticipation of meeting them was a tangled knot of excitement, apprehension, and a deep-seated longing for a connection I hadn't known I was missing. You're good at this. I shouted over the noise, trying to make conversation and perhaps distract myself from the precariousness of our mode of transport. Duyan laughed, the sound barely reaching me over the din. You get used to it, she shouted back. Besides, this is nothing. Wait till you see Hoi An during the tourist season. Before I knew it, the hustle and bustle of the city was far behind us, replaced by the tranquil beauty of the Vietnamese countryside. As we entered Hoi An, the city's famed lanterns began to light up the evening, casting a warm glow over the streets and the Tubon River. The historical charm of the city was immediately apparent, with its well-preserved architecture and bustling marketplaces offering a glimpse into Vietnam's rich cultural tapestry. Pulling up to a stop outside a traditional Vietnamese house nestled in a quiet street of the ancient town, Duyen killed the engine and dismounted the motorcycle. I followed suit. You ready? she asked, her eyes reflecting the lantern light. Taking a deep breath, I nodded. As I'll ever be. Relax, Spencer, you're among family here, Duyan said, smiling reassuringly. Duyan led me through the small, meticulously kept garden that fronted the house. The fading sunlight filtered through the leaves, casting dappled shadows on the path. She opened the door and stepped inside, her voice echoing as she called out, Banoi, Grandma, I'm home, we have a visitor. Her words seemed to hang in the air for a moment before a response came. A woman appeared from deeper within the house, a broom in hand as if caught in the middle of tidying up the house for guests. This house is such a damn mess, she lamented to herself. Despite the passage of time, her resemblance to the young woman in the photograph was unmistakable. Her eyes, sharp and discerning, softened as they met mine. I instantly recognized her as Tu Yet. Chao Khan, she greeted, her voice carrying a warmth that belied her initial scrutinizing glance. Setting aside the broom, she stepped forward, her movements carrying the grace of her youth. Chao Ko, I'm Spencer, Than's son. We talked over the phone, I said to her in Vietnamese. Tu Yet's eyes lingered on me, searching as if trying to find traces of my father in my features. Of course I know who you are, she reassured me. Extending her hand, she clasped mine, her grip firm, grounding. She reached out, her fingers lightly touching the side of my face. You have your father's eyes, she said softly, and his smile. Her own smile deepened. As we settled into the living room, a cozy space filled with the light of the setting sun, Tuyet turned to Duyen and instructed her to prepare a pot of tea. The air inside was cool, a respite from the day's warmth filled with the scent of jasmine and incense. Once Duyin had left to make the tea, Tu Yet gestured for me to take a seat on a cushioned bench near the window. Your name once more, please, she requested, her voice gentle. Spencer, I replied, watching her face as she tried to wrap her tongue around the unfamiliar sounds. With a soft chuckle, she shook her head. These English names are too complicated for my old ears, she admitted. Do you have a Vietnamese name? Sang, I said feeling a connection to that part of my heritage, even if it was one I rarely used. Sang, she repeated with a nod of approval. You look like a Sang. As Duyin came in with the tea, the aroma filled the room, a subtle invitation to relax and share more freely. 
Tuyet poured the tea with practiced ease, her hands steady despite their age. The conversation flowed easily, despite the weight of the reason for my visit. As I shared about my career as an engineer and my excitement and fears about becoming a parent soon, Tuyet listened intently. She spoke of her own experiences, touching on the challenges and joys of motherhood. As the initial pleasantries gave way to a comfortable silence, I took the opportunity to present the items I had brought with me, the checkered scarf and the photograph of a young Tuya. She studied them for a moment, her fingers tracing the fabric of the scarf, then shifting to the edges of the photograph. A myriad of emotions seemed to pass over her face, a silent conversation with memories long held. Without a word, she stood and walked over to a corner of the room where a small altar had been set up. It was dedicated to honoring the dead, filled with incense, small offerings, and photographs of loved ones. Among the photos displayed on the altar, I spotted the old torn photograph of my father. In the photo, Dad looked to be in his late teens or early twenties. He was wearing a simple button-up shirt. There was a warmth to him, a youthful optimism that seemed to leap out at me. Next to it, almost protectively, was a patch bearing the tiger insignia of the rangers, with reverence, Tuyet placed the photograph of her younger self next to my dad's. The torn edges of the two photos aligned almost perfectly, as if they were matching pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that had been separated for far too long. It's hard to believe we were ever that young, she murmured, her stare lingering on the altar. Life was simpler in some ways and so much harder in others. Tuyet sighed. I couldn't let Nan grow up bearing the stigma of being the son of an enemy soldier. I told everyone his father was a soldier from the North, one who had died fighting the Americans. It was easier, safer for him, she said. So in a way I've been mourning your father all these years. Tuyet returned to her seat next to me. May I ask, how did your father pass, she asked after a moment. Cancer, I replied. It was quick at the end. Tuyet nodded, a knowing sadness crossing her features. I'm not surprised. We didn't fully understand the horror of Agent Indigo back then, she reflected. We all suffered from its consequences, not just those directly caught in its flames. The fumes, the contaminated water. Hell, your dad and I waded waist-deep in that stuff. It seeped into our skin, into our blood, mutated us on a cellular level. The weight of her words hung in the air. It was years before we understood the full scope of the devastation, she continued. Spikes in cancer cases, stillbirths, and birth defects. The government eventually caught on and declared the area a disaster zone. My family, along with many others, had to resettle here in Hoi An. Tuyet's gaze was piercing, as if she was trying to read more into me. Have you, have you experienced any health complications? she asked. Other than asthma, I've been okay, I replied. Consider yourself lucky, then, Tuyet said softly, seeming not to believe her own words. After a long pause, she asked, Would you like to meet Nan? Tuyet and Duyen led me upstairs, the wooden steps creaking softly under our feet. As we ascended, Tuyet shared more about her life and Nan's. For the longest time, I thought I'd been spared the worst of Agent Indigo's effects. I've never been sick a day in my life, she said. Nan grew up healthy, strong, he had a good life. Reaching the top of the stairs, we paused at a door at the end of a short hallway. Tuyet lingered at the doorway as she continued. It wasn't until he was in his forties that we noticed changes. It started small, forgetfulness, mood swings, but it got worse quickly. Tuyet's eyes started misting over. We believe the change was triggered by the death of Duyen's mother, Nan's wife, in a tragic accident. I had to step in to help raise Duyen and put her through school. Duyan braced herself as she opened the door, her expression turning grave. The strong, unsettling stench of decay washed over me the moment the door creaked open. It was a smell that spoke of something deeply wrong. Duyan called into the dimness, her voice wavering slightly. Dad, someone is here to see you. A shadow stirred in the far corner of the room, the figure barely discernible in the scant light that filtered in through the drawn curtains. My heart raced as I stepped closer my eyes adjusting to the darkness, revealing the figure of a man tied securely to a chair. Nothing could prepare me for what I saw next. 
Nan's body bore the unmistakable signs of severe mutation, skin mottled with tumorous growths, limbs twisted in unnatural angles, and eyes that glowed with a feral, unsettling light. Agent Indigo had consumed him, leaving behind a grotesque shell of the man. His head snapped towards us as we entered, the sound of the chains rattling against the chair's arms. The snarl that escaped him was chilling, a sound no human should make, filled with pain and rage and an insatiable hunger. Fighting to stifle a scream, I steadied my voice, trying to reach whatever part of Nan might still recognize kindness, or perhaps even family. Nan, I'm Spencer, you're... I'm your brother, I stammered. At the sound of my voice, a low growl emanated from Nan's throat, a sound that cut through me like a knife. His restraints creaked as he strained against them, his jaw snapping viciously in the air between us. Duyan stepped beside me, her presence a small comfort. He has his moments of clarity, but they're becoming fewer and fewer, she explained softly, her voice heavy with unspoken sorrow. It's been hard on us, but we manage, day by day. That night after a subdued dinner, Duyan showed me to a small bedroom on the ground floor they had set aside for me its windows offering a view of the garden under the moonlight. I settled into the bed, the weight of the day pressing down on me. The moonlight spilled across the floor, casting shadows that seemed to dance with my tumultuous thoughts. My phone buzzed with an incoming video call, a welcome distraction. It was Mira. Hey, what's up? I greeted her. Nothing much, she replied, her smile brightening the screen. I just miss seeing your face. Oh, I miss you too, babe, I say, longing for her comforting embrace. So how did it go with two yet? she asked. The question hung heavily in the air. I hesitated, unsure of how to navigate the truth of my encounter with Nan. It went great, I lied, forcing a smile. She's... she's really something. Mira's smile widened, but before she could respond, her expression shifted, a hand instinctively cradling her belly. Oh, wait, you've got to see this. The baby's kicking like crazy. She adjusted the phone, pointing the camera down to her belly. Watching her, the warmth of the moment was overshadowed by a sudden, sickening sense of dread. The revelation of Nan's condition, the mutations and the dire possibilities they represented, loomed large in my mind. Could the baby in Mira's womb be a ticking time bomb? Had I inherited the same mutation that had ravaged Nan and passed it on without knowing? Mira's voice pulled me back from the brink of panic. Can you see it? It's like he's trying to say hello to his daddy. I nodded, my throat tight with unspoken fear. Yeah, I see it. That's... that's amazing, Mira. Welcome, my dear friends. If you liked the video, don't forget to leave your lovely comment below and hit the like button. For more entertaining and informative videos, press the subscribe button and activate the bell to receive all the new updates. Your support helps to spread the content and reach the widest audience. Thank you.